looks really different. I'm just looking at a blank screen, so it'll be interesting navigating this. Uh, well, welcome everyone. My name is Bridget Neese. Um, I live here in Grand Marais. I um, own Ancient Traditions Healing. I do body work, um, healing kind of of all sorts. I teach yoga and I am a master herbalist. I practice both Western herbalism and uh, Ayurvedic medicine. So um, anybody that knows me well knows that I'm super passionate about plants. I kind of always have been. I have really clear memories um, as a child, walking um, kind of out in nature with my grandparents. They lived in kind of a rural area and I spent summers with them every year and asking, you know, what's that called? What's that called? What's, what's this granny? What's, what's this one called? I was um, always gathering and bundling plants and bringing, you know, little bouquets of different flowers. Um, I remember sneaking little jars and old spice jars and anything I could get my hands on and taking it out with me and um, putting little bits of, of plant material in there and making magic potions uh, that gave my horse superpowers or gave me invisibility. Um, <laughs> so I have lots of fond memories of being out in nature and um, connecting with plants ever since I was young. Uh, when I was in college, I um, went to school, I was studying marketing, and I think I was late for every single one of my college courses because I was across the street at a metaphysical store either chatting with the herbalist about um, you know the plants there or reading a book about some form of healing or herbalism uh, it's funny that it took me four years of college being late for every class to realize <laughs> where my energies and my true um, passion lied um, so as soon as i graduated from college i immediately went to school and started studying massage therapy and herbalism and other forms of healing I would say that my um, interest in herbalism was kind of, you know, as a family herbalist, just looking at things to help support myself and my family, primarily um, for, you know, maybe the first 10 years or so that I was interested in, in herbalism. I had lots of books around, um, would, would make things for myself or make things for, you know, people in my family, pretty simple preparations. And then about 10 years ago, I you know, took the step to start advancing my um, path in herbalism and got my master's in herbalism. And then afterwards, I um, started studying Ayurvedic medicine as well. So I'm super excited to be here talking about one of my favorite subjects. You know, we're really blessed to live in the place where we live. Um, the plants are starting to come alive now. So the timing for this class is amazing. Um, you know, the other beautiful thing about where we live is, I mean, pretty easily, I could sit down with a pen and a piece of paper and probably come up with like 120, and this, that's not even inclusive, different medicinal varieties that we have here growing in this place that we call home. The other beautiful thing about where we live is that we've got lots of wild spaces um, to harvest where we don't have to worry about contamination or pollution of the plants. Um, although we do have some plants that are endangered and I, and I will talk about that just a little bit more and about um, you know, harvesting sustainably and having a lot of awareness around that when we are harvesting and working with the plants. Um, the way that we're going to do class today, we're going to be meeting here for about an hour and a half, and then we'll take a nice big break for lunch where you can all go and nourish yourself and hopefully get outside, enjoy a little bit of the sunshiny day, um, maybe interact with a couple of plants that we've talked about. Then we'll come back after lunch. We'll talk a little bit more about sustainable harvesting, um, some really simple ways to dry and preserve the plants um, if you are out wild harvesting. And then we'll kind of transition into talking about um, kind of the nuts and bolts of maybe putting together your own medicinal herb garden, what that might look like, things to consider, um, plants that you might want to work with, that kind of stuff. So that's kind of the general um, outline of what we'll be um, talking about today. You know, I also would just really like to say that um, you can learn a lot about plants in books. There's a lot of really great information and I'd encourage you um, to know the constituents of, of plants and um, 
to know, you know, what families they're from and a lot of information about them. But truly, the way that we learn about plants is about is by getting out in nature and connecting with them and using them. So I would like to consider today um, an introduction to the plants to begin kind of a lifelong relationship that you might have with them. Uh, let's see, anything else that we need to talk about before we just dive in? Um, I tend to be one that wants to share lots of information and trying to keep myself uh, on a time schedule can sometimes be a little bit challenging, but I'll try to keep uh, an awareness around the time so that we can get to as many of these plants um, as possible today. I'm thinking that we're going to share, I don't know, maybe somewhere between 12 and 15 of the local plants. I'm getting to know different things about them, how to identify them, some of their medicinal qualities, um, some good combinations, um, maybe some interesting folklore, or other, uh, other things about the plants that I find interesting. Um, so you'll have a nice, a nice selection of plants to start working with, okay? So first off, uh, off the bat, I'd like to start talking about a plant called jewelweed. Uh, jewelweed is um, growing right outside my front door. So um, let's see. Oh, just a little note there. I can change my screen. Sorry. <laughs> oh, oh, I did want to say that. Actually, that's a really good reminder is that as I'm talking, if you have questions um, about something that I've said or something seems unclear or you just want to ask another question maybe about something that I didn't cover about a plant, there is a little Q&A box at the bottom of your screen that if you'll just go in there and type your question in, then as I get to the end of talking about each of the plants before I transition, I'll try to pop in there and just check for questions so that I can answer those sort of as we go along. Um, so that's the best way in this sort of webinar format to kind of create that flow. So if something comes up as, as I'm talking, just put it in the Q&A and then I'll try to remember to check that fairly regularly to get questions answered. Okay, jewelweed, <laughs> my friend jewelweed. Um, you know, there's often a, you know, a saying amongst herbalists that uh, you can learn a lot about yourself by looking at your front door and finding out what the closest um, plant growing to the entrance to your house is. Uh, I did a little thing on WTIP with a couple other local herbalists sometime last fall. And we talked about this a little bit on air. And it was really, really fascinating to start learning about the plants that people had growing right outside of their front door and, and somehow making those connections and what they felt like the plant was um, reflecting to them or what, what they felt like the message was from that particular plant. So um, jewelweed is a plant that I've always really loved and uh, have, har have harvested at different times. It wasn't until I think maybe three years ago that a large, large patch started growing here, just right outside of my door. Um, I had never noticed it before. I can't say for sure that it wasn't present, but I, I'm pretty sure it wasn't there. Uh, and then that same year, uh, I developed a really intense case of hives. I went to a bunch of doctors, um, couldn't end up finding you know, any, any cause, so to speak, uh, and ended up using some jewelweed salve, which was what um, finally resolved it. So I have a, a pretty intimate and sweet relationship now with jewelweed. Um, but I remember this plant as a child too. You might know it as um, spotted touch-me-nots. One of the great things about um, jewelweed is these little pods. Actually, I want to pull up a picture of it here for you. So let's see, here we go. So spotted jewelweed. I don't know if you guys can see my little cursor as it moves across the screen here or not, but if you look at the end of this little branch here, you can kind of see this um, kind of fattening. This is a little pot. If you've ever had an experience with this plant, you'll remember it because as they start to um, ripen, if you touch them with just the slightest amount of pressure, the little pod will explode. And if you really kind of get um, up close to this plant as they have in this picture here, the flowers are absolutely beautiful. They're like the sweetest little orchids in the most lovely color. 
So jewelweed, as I kind of um, alluded to here, um, is really good for skin irritations. The other reason that um, I love this plant is I grew up in Texas. Poison ivy is a real thing there. Um, I don't seem to have a real sensitivity to um, poison ivy, but a lot of friends and family did. And jewelweed is one of those plants that is very, very effective against um, skin, rashes, and irritations in general, but specifically poison ivy. And the very interesting thing about this plant is that often you will find them um, growing in tandem together. So often if you find jewelweed and you're in an area where poison ivy grows, um, we, don't, we don't have to worry about that quite so much here, but if you're somewhere like in, in Texas, let's say where it grows and you see jewelweed, it almost it acts as like a marker, a warning sign that there is gonna be poison ivy somewhere nearby. So it's very interesting that that both the cause of the rash and the antidote will often be um, living kind of harmoniously in the same um, you know area kind of so to speak. Uh, this plant loves kind of wet sort of shady areas typically at least areas I would say most often where there's like partial shade. Um, at my house it grows just under a little stand of trees um, not too far from my front door that stays a little bit damp and is, and is mostly shaded most of the time. And at this point, I have a really lovely stand of it growing. Um, so this plant, um, when you harvest it, um, and we'll talk more about harvesting because that's another piece of this that I'm, I'm very, very passionate about. Um, but this plant, because of how it seeds, um, when you harvest it early in the spring, you wanna kind of try to only harvest like the, um, the kind of the top third of the plant. So it still has the opportunity to flower and seed and each of the plants can continue through its life cycle. The other thing about this plant is you need to be really, really careful when you are harvesting from this plant. Um, it tends to have very, very shallow roots and any kind of like aggressive harvesting, like pulling the leaves off can really easily uproot this plant. So you wanna be using some kind of like small harvesting scissors or something um, so that you can do that work quite delicately and not disturb the um, root structure. What else do I wanna say about this plant? So, um, you know, anti-inflammatory, uh, antihistamine. So good for, for, especially for inflammations of the skin. I, this is not recommended for internal use. So we're gonna be looking mostly at kind of topical uses for this one. Um, you can use the plant fresh, you know, like out, out in, in nature, um, if something came up, you could just use the plant, kind of bruise it, and it, it's mm, kind of a little bit like a milky sap, and you could just use that directly on a bug bite, you know, any kind of skin irritation like that. Um, you could use it directly on it. Otherwise, this plant really is better used fresh. So you're going to want to then immediately after harvesting um, be able to preserve it uh, in some kind of an oil, uh, depending on how you're using it, like if you're going to end up using the oil on the skin or trans transforming it into some kind of a salve, or you could freeze the fresh material. Um, I know people that, that do that, they kind of freeze it in little ice cubes and then put, once the ice cubes are frozen, put it in a little bag, and then both the cold of the ice cube and the um, plant material can be really, really soothing to that kind of, any kind of rashy sort of condition. Let me think, is there anything else I wanna talk about this one? Oh, Julie, where it gets its name is that the leaves itself are, are quite waxy in, in nature. And so if you see them in the early morning because of that waxiness, little, little balls of dew tend to kind of build up you know, at the edges of the plant um, here and in the little crooks. And in that morning light, it will catch it and you'll get those little kind of shining diamond sort of effect. And that's where it actually gets the name jewelweed from. Um, anything else? Oh, so this is one that I haven't explored. Um, I stumbled across it in a book I was reading or maybe on a, 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 a blog or something that one of my herbal friends has, but they were talking about a combination of this plant and cedar being really lovely for keeping the ticks away. So this year I was thinking about harvesting a little bit of this um, and combining it with some cedar or even maybe some cedar wood essential oil and trying it out um, for ticks, uh, making a little spray or an oil that I could put kind of on my ankles 
potentially maybe even trying it on my on my dog too. So um, that's that's a possibility for this plant. Uh, what else? Oh, rose, a plant that we're going to talk about a little bit later, um, is also a really nice combination with jewelweed um, for those uh, kind of skin irritations or sores, especially ones that are kind of weepy, that kind of seem um, like there's a lot of moisture, um, pus, weepiness, that kind of stuff. That can be a really lovely combination for that. Okay, beautiful. So let's see here. Ah, I'm seeing now that as I'm in this screen where I'm sharing the plants, I can't see the Q&A. Okay, well that's interesting. So then maybe I will just cover a couple more plants and then I'll pop out and check the Q&A. Maybe we'll just flow through it a little bit that way. All right, so the next plant that I would like to introduce to you is... Oh, we're out of order here a little bit. Sorry about that. Let me try to navigate. I've got a whole bunch of stuff in the way here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do, doing um, this in this way is a little bit new to me, so I apologize. We'll ask for some patience. All right, so here's our next plant that we're going to talk about. It's horsetail. There we go. Okay, beautiful. So horsetail. Um, this is another one that tends to really like damp areas. Kind of often find it growing like at the edges of um, marshes, ponds, lakes, even um, if it's not growing near water or you don't see water at the time, you can almost guarantee that it's some time of the year um, that water tends to collect there. I have a pretty um, damp area here on my property that's considered lowland. And so we have a little bit of horsetail here. Interestingly, it, it tends to, to show up in my garden beds that are not too far from that. So it's made itself a happy home and then just kind of established itself in my garden beds where there's some nice loose um, nutrient dense soil. So it's a very interesting plant. Um, you can kind of see by looking at the screen here, it's, uh, it's got kind of these jointed, almost like the way that bamboo looks. It is a hollow stem. And then um, it's got kind of these like pine cone sort of cones at the top. And then I want to show you another picture about what it ends up looking like once it started kind of leafing out. So maybe you'll recognize this one. This is kind of more of the leafed out version of horsetail. So I'll go back between these two so that you can kind of look at the two different ones. You can sort of see where this darkening area is on um, the, the sort of reed itself. That's where, you know, you can almost, if you look really, really close here, hopefully that got bigger. If you look really, really close at these kind of dark areas, you can see these little kind of spindles that come out and that'll end up being where the leaves start to form themselves. So now as we look back at this photo, you can kind of see those joints and where the, where the leaves sort of start to come out. So um, horsetail can look a little bit different depending on which stage of its progression it's in. Uh, another name for this is shave grass or snake grass. The parts that are used um, for medicine are going to be the what we would call aerial parts or the parts that are above the ground. It can get quite tall. Um, the stuff on my property doesn't get this tall. I think it doesn't stay wet year round and so it, it stays a little closer to the ground. But I have done some, some hiking in, in more like bog areas or seen it growing around some ponds where it's not disturbed, where it can get quite tall, you know, like maybe a couple of feet tall in some places. Um, like I said, it's hollow and it has a very mild taste, um, maybe something kind of akin to like celery um, would be maybe the closest thing that I could uh, liken it to. The best time to harvest it is in the spring when it's still quite tender and um, dense. Uh, it's very, very high in minerals, especially potassium and a compound called silica. So for that reason, it's really good for strengthening um, like hair, skin, and nails. 
So as kind of a um, tonifying supportive therapy, it can be good for anything, you know, that has to do with um, weekend nails, uh, you know, maybe even if I was dealing with some nail fungus kind of issues, I would use another herb specifically for the fungus, but maybe use something like this in the background of a formula to just kind of strengthen and support the, the nails or the hair or whatever it was that I was working with. Um, I'm not sure if I said it's also very high in minerals, which makes it very nutritive. So um, anytime there's some kind of like weakness in the system or you're trying to rebuild perhaps like after an illness, something like that, this could be an herb that potentially, you know, I would look to to kind of re rebuild the constitution. Um, it can also, it sort of has an affinity for the urinary system, so it can be helpful for like urinary tract infections. Um, because of that silica, uh, it can also be really good for like um, connective tissue injuries or some forms of like arthritis. Uh, you'll often see it in, in some of those formulas. Um, externally for like minor wounds or burns, it can be, um, it can be really helpful. What else do I want to say about this one? Um, I won't be able to go through contradictions of all plants. Um, Contraindications would be um, times that you would want to steer clear specifically of using a plant. Um, pregnancy is one of those that um, there's a lot of plants are contraindicated. Some of them I would say more so just because there aren't enough studies to say that they are safe. Um, certainly when you're getting started out, you want to err on the side of safety, um, especially in cases of pregnancy. But, but you know, anytime someone is taking another kind of medication um, or has any kind of underlying conditions, you certainly want to be really, really careful about that. You know, this isn't an advanced herbalism class, so we're not going to be able to go through and, and really um, dig into like all the possible contraindications. But on some of the herbs, um, I will mention things, you know, definitely this would be one that I would avoid during pregnancy, but um, also with um, heart or kidney disorders, um, diabetes, uh, perhaps cases of gout, there's, there's a couple of different ones. So this is one maybe that I would exercise a little caution if there were some underlying health conditions. It's also one that you don't necessarily want to use for prolonged periods of time. It would be something that you would use for a short time for a very specific thing or for something that was acute, but not something that you would take kind of long term. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Great. So let's see here. Uh, I'm feeling like maybe we're going to stop the share here just for a minute. I want to pop into the Q&A. Can jewelry be dried is a question that popped up in the um, questions and answers here. Um, jewelry really is best used fresh, in, in my opinion, um, which is why I kind of talked about um, using the fresh material to put into like an oil, if you were going to do some kind of oil tincturing or um, preserving it by freezing the fresh material, it's really best used um, fresh. It loses a lot of its um, potency and its ability to really soothe. Um, as it dries. Is it completely ineffective dried? Hmm. You know, I guess I'm not 100% sure how I would answer that. It's not a plant that I typically use dried. I try, I try to come up with some kind of a fresh preparation for that one. And let's see, it looks like maybe some stuff has showed up in the chat box too. So I'm trying to get into there. Let's see. Oh, that looks like just stuff. Oh, how to prepare and consume horsetail. So um, prepare and consumption of that one, again, it could very easily be tinctured. Horsetail is one that you can dry. Um, and so if I'm making like a hair, skin and nail formula, um, you can pop it into a tea. It's got a super mild flavor. Um, so, hmm, the question there? you see it on the bottom? Yeah, okay. I think that's Karen talking to everyone. Um, so it can be dried and added into a tea and it's got a very mild flavor. That'll be something we can talk about a little bit later as well is that a lot of um, herbs have a very, medicinal herbs anyway, have a very strong flavor. 
So um, using them in teas, then you're either going to need to be working something like mint or something in to kind of create a pleasant tasting tea. Or if it's got a really strong flavor, sometimes it's, it's easier or better to put it kind of in um, some kind of a tincture or something that can just be taken quickly um, just because of the intensity of the flavor. Okay, um, hopefully that answered your question. Okay, so let's pop back in and let's move to our next plant, which is hiding behind the control screen. Hmm. Ah, thanks, Karen. <laughs> it's good to have her in the background helping me navigate all this stuff. Wild rose. Um, wow, what a beautiful and lovely plant and um, has several different um, uses, applications. So, you know, when we think about roses, we often think about like Valentine's Day or um, we see rose as like a symbol of, of um, or an expression of, of love very much in our culture. Interestingly, the plant does have an affinity for the heart and um, rose can be very tonifying for the heart. So uh, interesting that there's that connection there. Um, so both the petals for roses uh, can be used and the hips. So this is a, a picture of wild rose with the petals here. I'm going to toggle over and this is more what the fruit um, of rose. So the rose hip itself looks like. I'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a second. So um, how would I describe this plant? I mean, I think it's one that most people kind of know and can recognize. Uh, kind of a spready, um, thorny shrub, um, I think would be a good description. It, it does tend to have um, roots that it'll, you know, kind of send everywhere if you have any growing on your property or in a flower bed uh, and you've ever tried to dig it up or plant anything around it, you've probably experienced this very, very um, spready kind of dense expanse of roots that they tend to put out. The flowers can either be this sort of pale pink um, to, you know, even a, a lighter kind of almost white with more of just a touch to pink. I have seen a few that um, are growing wild up here that are a little bit darker. It's kind of the, the beautiful thing about um, plants growing in the wild to kind of uh, see and experience all the different variations of them. Um, what else will I say about uh, this? So the hip itself, which is going to be um, this part of the plant, you wanna harvest this um, much later in the fall. This is usually kind of one of my last or you know close to the last harvest of the season. Sometimes uh, I prefer to harvest these after we've had our first frost. Um, so once there's been kind of a nice frost, I'll usually go out and harvest those. The, the petals of the rose itself, that's, that's going to be more like early summer. Um, and in this photo that I pulled up um, to show you a picture of these, you can see kind of all the lovely little dew drops on it. It looks really uh, beautiful, but that's really not the ideal time to harvest these guys. Uh, if it's pretty damp and dewy in the morning, I will wait a little while to go out and harvest, um, not in the heat of the day, but where the sun has been out enough to mostly or completely dry the plant materials. Uh, the thing with roses is that they can tend, they tend towards mildewy kind of states. Um, it's a plant that you want to really check the plant out before you start harvesting from it. It can also um, have aph aphids and other kinds of pests. So checking to really make sure that it's a nice, healthy plant that you would be um, uh, asking to harvest from. I do like the, the petals and the plant material, especially on this one and a few others that I'll mention, to be um, fairly dry so that we're not dealing with um, issues of mold. Mm. And you do want you you do want the the plant to the material to be really healthy and vibrant. So kind of on this, you can sort of see that there's some petals over here that are maybe like you know past peak, so to speak, or damaged by insects or other things. 
Um, I mean, I don't have to have 100% perfect petals, but it needs to have some kind of um, vibrancy, uh, that kind of energetic prana or chi of the plant really needs to be present. Um, that kind of represents the potency and the life force uh, and the vibration of the plant itself. So I kind of mentioned um, that this, this plant is, um, is associated with the heart and can be heart tonic. Um, rose water itself, it actually is a really good wound wash. Um, I think I mentioned it with jewelweed um, just a few plants ago, that it can be really good for weepy, weepy kinds of wounds, especially. Um, it's, you know, rose is also what I feel like kind of has an energetic emotional connection to the heart. So I also feel like this one um, can be a really soft, supportive plant for um, people that are going through like difficult emotional things, um, working through some levels of sadness. And, and I say that it, not so much that it has like um, phytochemicals or constituents that necessarily make it a good choice for depression, but it does have kind of this um, softening and energetic kind of uplifting um, quality around kind of the heart center itself. The um, hips itself are really, really high in vitamin C, which is, um, which is maybe the quality that they're most known for. Uh, a couple of things about harvesting the hips, we talked about you know, that I prefer to harvest them after the first frost. If you've ever um, eaten a hip or harvested them, um, most of the time, like if you buy them from you know, an herb place or something, they've been cut and sifted. So if you are doing harvesting yourself, what you're going to find is they are full, full of these little seeds and little hairs on the inside. So one thing that you do need to know about harvesting hips is that um, you're going to need to find a good method that you like for kind of getting the hairs and those seeds out. Um, the two methods that I um, sort of prefer here are either when they're fresh, you kind of cut off the little, what I would call the top, let's move over here, kind of this little, little top part where the petals were once attached and have now kind of dried away. You wanna cut that off and then cut the hip in half and then you'll have these two little halves. And then I just take like my, my smallest little, I don't know what it is, maybe it's a quarter teaspoon uh, spoon that's on my set and I just sort of scoop out that little seedy part. That's how I do it if I've harvested them and I've appropriately made time <laughs> to deal with them uh, when I get home. And we're going to talk about that a little bit too because that is um, one of the conundrums I find I get myself into um, more so when I first started doing a lot of wild harvesting, but it honestly still happens a little bit now. I make time in my day to go out and do some wild harvesting. I end up finding more things than I thought or just I'm just enjoying being out in nature or I harvest more things than I was initially going out for and then I've got a lot of plant material to then process when I get back. So if I find myself in that position, what I have done before is I have um, just cut the hips, um, the little knob off the top and cut them in half and then I have in the past dehydrated them. And then once they're fully dehydrated, I um, have taken them and kind of rubbed them, rolled them back and forth on screen. And it sort of separates out the outer now dry shell of the hip from the sort of seedy part. And then you can pretty fairly easily kind of pick through the material. So that is another option. Um, I'm sure there's other options out there. Those are the two that I use most often. And, and it's just about, you know, kind of a timing thing for me. If I make the appropriate amount of time doing it the first way where you cut them in half and go ahead and scoop it out before they dry, uh, it seems like the most efficient way. But maybe, you know, you've experienced something else or um, maybe you'll stumble across something else and you could share another great <laughs> idea with me. All right. Um, so as I mentioned, those are super high in vitamin C. Um, also good for reducing inflammation, um, specifically in the system around things um, that are autoimmune 
kind of related. So um, some different types of autoimmune forms of arthritis or fibromyalgia. This can be a really lovely. It also tends to have an affinity for like the, ur the urinary system, bladders, kidneys. So it can be a nice supportive um, herb in, in those kinds of formulas. Um, it also sort of has an affinity for, for women's health, women's systems. So um, it can also be a really lovely supportive one to put in to those formulas as well. Things that um, Rose combines really nice with, um, you know, if you wanted to make like a, a very simple heart tea with like some hibiscus, use the rose petals and the hips, uh, maybe alongside with some hawthorn perhaps. Um, I kind of mentioned the combination before of the jewelweed and the rose for weepy kinds of skin sort of things. You know, rose actually has um, some antimicrobial um, elements as well. So rose water for kind of acne or um, facial stuff, it can both be really nurturing to the skin and that kind of micro, my, ooh, anti <laughs> uh, microbial uh, element can help with, with um, some, some types of acne. Uh, what else do you, oh, rose hip jam. It's my favorite thing to do with this plant. I can't believe I almost forgot about that. So collecting the rose hips and then making a jam by themselves, it can be pretty tart. I have apple trees here on my property. So I will do mostly rose hips with a little bit of apple and make a jam. Sometimes put like a little bit of cinnamon or something in with it. And then all winter long, you've got this great um, source of vitamin C that you can um, use in all the ways that you can use jam, right? <laughs> all kinds of fun uh, things there. Um, hmm, anything else I wanna say about this plant? I think that's it. Let's pop into the Q and A because I see that some have showed up here. All right, so after the hips are dried, should they be broken or ground before being infused in oil? I, I do, I mean, um, you know, it's, it's not necessary. I tend to be of the school of thought that if you're gonna be infusing them into something, um, you want as, as much contact surface with the solvent that you're diffusing them into as possible. So for most plant material, I'm gonna cut it up pretty small, or if it's already dried, kind of crush it a little bit. Uh, there's a few plants that um, once it's dried, I'll kind of run it through a spice grinder or a coffee grinder to break it up even a little bit more before I put it into the um, alcohol or oil solvent, whatever you know I'm doing to proceed with it for there. A formula for rose water is the next question that's on here. Um, you know, to make true true rose water, kind of like the stuff that you would um, buy in the store, it's a distillation process which isn't something that's easy necessarily to do at home. But I have um, just like literally made, like steeped a really strong tea of roses. And then it needs to get stored in the refrigerator if you do it that way. But then, you know, you can use it for um, three to five days, I would say, that it's, that it's really effective. The other idea with that would be to um, put it into something more like witch hazel, like if specifically you wanted to be using it for the face, you could put the rose petals um, into a witch hazel solution and infuse the witch hazel and then get kind of the qualities of both of those plants. Okay, somebody else here. Would you do that same preparation of rose hips for a tea or use whole? Um, so again, typically speaking, if I'm gonna be um, using plant material in a tea or making a tincture, whether it's alcohol or oil tincture, um, I think the, the more points of contact that you have with whatever solvent um, that you're trying to extract the medicinals out, the better. So with my rose hips, I don't grind them down necessarily um, when I'm making a tea because then they see, sneak out through um, the little holes in my tea strainers. Um, but I do kind of cr crush them up. Um, from a purely medicinal standpoint, I crush them pretty small. Although I will say sometimes whenever I'm making tea, I'll leave um, some pieces a little bit bigger because from a hmm, aesthetics kind of 
uh, point of view, it looks really lovely to have some kind of bigger chunks that are very distinguished, you know, that you can see what they are amongst the other plant material. So hopefully that, that helps to answer that question. And you know, guys, because this is um, a webinar and set up this way that, you know, we're not necessarily dialoguing and I'm just kind of going in and reading these and then answering. If I'm not really um, getting to the heart of your question or, or you still need more clarification, please feel free to, to say that there. I'm really happy to go as um, deep into any of these topics as possible. Um, so if, if you're feeling like you're not really getting your, your question answered when I address it, just pop, pop it back in there, ask it again in a different way, or just say, could you give me some more um, on that? And I'm happy to. Okay, um, I, think, I think that's probably good on rows. Let's see, ah, yarrow. Yarrow is gonna be the next plant that we're gonna talk about. Yarrow is the first medicinal plant that I ever planted. <laughs> it, was, it was the start of everything. I remember buying it um, at a little nursery. I was still living in Texas. Uh, it was my first home. It was putting in, not, I was not creating a medicinal herb garden at all. I was putting in some little flowers and stuff, but that I, I knew that yarrow could be used medicinally. Um, at the time, I was using a yarrow and rosehip tea um, that, an, that the herbalist across from my school that was always making me, she wasn't making me, I was making myself late talking to her. <laughs> um, I had picked up a yarrow and rosehip tea from her once whenever I was sick. And then um, when I was at the nursery picking up um, flowers, I came across a yarrow plant and I was so excited. And it was the first uh, medicinal plant that I, that I ever ever planted. Um, all right, so yarrow, yeah, uh, it's a great one. And there's lots and lots of it up here. Um, part of its Latin name, and one of the ways to help distinguish this one from some of the other plants that maybe at first glance can look a little bit similar to this, is the leaves. Um, part of its Latin name is um, uh, milliflorum, and it means thousand, thousand leaves. The, the leaves have almost kind of this like feathery quality, I think is how I would describe it, within these white clusters um, of flowers. Let's see, I think I've got a picture. Yeah, there we go. There's a close up um, of the flowers. And yarrow had a very um, distinct smell. Um, I think maybe some people would say distinct odor. <laughs> I say distinct smell. Um, because like many things, I've sort of fallen in love with uh, the, sm the smell of certain plants, like valerian is one that has a very strong, very spe specific smell that many I think would call an odor that smells something like dirty socks, um, but that I kind of love. <laughs> Um, so, all right, let's talk about this. So yarrow, um, one of the other names for yarrow is nosebleed, thousand leaf, carpenter's weed, staunch weed. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of other ones. It's, it's actually one that's been written about in history kind of a lot. It'll, you'll see it pop up in, in stories called different things. And they're usually talking about yarrow in some um, some combination about being you know, used in the field for wounds. I think there's actually a story, if I remember right, um, about Achilles actually using uh, this plant in the Battle of Troy. I don't, I don't have a clear remembrance of what story it was that I read, but uh, I, I do remember that. And that is true. Yarrow is a great first aid um, wound plant. It's also really great for um, kind of colds and fevers. So it's got a nice range of uses. Uh, it can be used fresh, like out in the field, um, either the leaves or the flowers. This is one that dries really nicely. Um, I use pr predominantly the flowers for, for teas, but you can use both the leaves and the flowers. Um, you can also make a really lovely um, I keep a little tin this in my kind of wilderness first aid kit that you can take the dried flowers and um, run them through a coffee grinder or a spice grinder, um, at least that's what I use, um, and, and almost powder it. And you can 
use that powder in kind of an emergency field situation to sort of pack in uh, a wound. What it does is it encourages um, the blood to coagulate and it'll stop bleeding pretty fast. I mean, it's, it's, it's really effective. Hmm. So before I get <laughs> too far off on storytelling here, let's see, what else do we want to talk about this plant? Um, a creeping perennial, it, um, it will usually be found in like little colonies. You'll find like little clusters of it growing together. It can get tallish. Um, I would say most often it's probably in that like foot and a half to two feet, but it can get as tall as like maybe three feet tall, um, depending on kind of the soil and the conditions. This is one that you know you'll see a lot like on roadsides, like dry, gravelly areas. It's it's pretty it's pretty hardy in that way. I talked a little bit about the um, sort of feathery leaves, and I feel like um, it's got kind of a when you look at it amongst all of the other greenery around it, that it almost has this like grayish sort of um, like a silvery gray tone about it, like the color is just a slightly different shade of green than the stuff around it. Um, you'll find it, yep, along roadsides. The best time to harvest this one, and this is going to be different than a, a lot of plants, so a lot of plants where you're going to be harvesting plant material, like leaves and stuff, if the flowers aren't used, you're going to want to harvest it before it goes to flower and starts putting its energy into flowering. This one, because we want to use the flowers, we're going to wait to harvest this one until it's kind of in full bloom. So this picture right here, like this is perfect, perfect harvesting time. And again, we're going to talk about harvesting responsibly a little bit later. I'm, I'm not, not addressing that. It's a very important thing to me. Um, right now, we're going to just kind of move through these plants and then we'll spend a little bit of time um, if you have questions around harvesting and how to do that responsibly and sustainably. Uh, we will address that later. So, but this is, this is a beautiful plant. This is, would be kind of like the perfect sort of ideal time to be harvesting. Um, hmm. We talked about how I have kind of that, the powdered sort of um, emergency 10 that I keep in my wilderness first aid, but also making a salve out of yarrow for like external stuff. One of the things that it's very good um, to use on in a salve form, or even uh, if you haven't made a salve, just like tinctured in an oil, so the plant material in oil, um, is for bruising. You know, if you fall or, you know, hit yourself on something and you have, you know, kind of a big bruise, so that stagnated um, blood in the area, or even preventing, right, after you have an injury that you think is probably going to leave a pretty big mark, starting right away with the yarrow salve, it helps to um, kind of move things through the area and prevent that kind of stagnation of blood. So it can be really good in preventing major bruising in an area, or if the damage has been done and it's already there, um, applying a yarrow salve externally can be really helpful in kind of helping the body speed along the process of um, healing up that the the bruise hmm. yeah uh, what else would i like to say about this one we talked about drying it um you can use the fresh leaves too you know like if you don't do the the dried yarrow powder and you were out in the field even even just grabbing some of the leaves and uh flowers. I remember running into a, into a, a friend uh, in town and they had this really um, funny looking uh, sort of bandage on their arm with sticks sticking out of each side, like some like leafy material. And I was like, what's, what's going on? What's going on in your arm there? And they told me a story that they had been out in the woods and I think uh, like a broken off stick or something from a tree when they passed by, left a pretty big gouge in their arm. And I don't remember who they were out in the woods with, but they gathered up a bunch of yarrow plant material and packed it on there and just kind of tied it uh, with something like a strip of cloth or something to their arm and they were still walking around with it and they were like is this is this crazy that I'm doing this and I said oh actually no not at all <laughs> Yara's great for that um, but just one of those kind of funny stories 
What else is yarrow for, uh, good for? It does have some anti-inflammatory um, properties, so it can be good for um, adding to a formula for like uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, it, it can help to regulate the menstrual cycle um, for people if you have some really heavy bleeding. Um, sometimes a yarrow tea or a little bit of yarrow tincture will just help the body regulate the, the flow of that a little bit. Um, as I mentioned, it can be really good in a tea for uh, colds and flus for a couple different reasons. It helps to break up congestion, kind of in the same way that I talked about in the bruising. It kind of helps to disperse that. So sort of think of that same um, quality in the lungs. It kind of helps to disperse congestion. And then it's also really good um, for fevers as well. Yeah. So colds with fevers, this would be a great one. I'm going to talk about another plant um, that grows up here that looks a little bit similar that's called bone set. And the two of those together um, can be really nice for like a tea when fever, uh, sorry, a cold when fever is involved. Um, yarrow with St. John's wort, which also grows up here, can be a nice combination for kind of external um, bruising, trauma to the, to the muscle tissues sorts of things. Hmm. Yeah. I think, I don't know, I think that's a good amount of information to start with on this one. Let's see, are there any questions in here? It looks like, yeah. Will you be making recommendations for especially helpful books? I do, I do have a, a list of books, um, some of my favorites, um, especially some of my favorites that are about medicinal plants that grow here in our area because I remember that was one of the things that I really struggled with in the beginning when I was you know trying to get to know the plants I had these big books with like all of these diverse plants and it was really interesting but it made it quite difficult to kind of hone in on what was there and available in my specific area and I, I find it's much easier to learn when you're first getting started if you have books like that so I do have a list of maybe like 10 or 12 books um, at the end, um, towards the end of the presentation this afternoon that I will share with you for sure. All right. Well, if that's all the questions for now, we'll go ahead and move forward. Hmm. So this is another one that I have um, growing here on the property voluntarily. Uh, it showed up, interestingly, uh, about the same time that the jewel reed showed up. These two can be really nice counterparts to each other because the next plant that we are going to talk about is sorry i just need to backtrack my photos aren't quite in order here nope. gotta keep going metal there we go yeah so um if you've ever come in contact with this plant you likely remember it uh, my first experience with this plant i was young Mm, I don't know, maybe like eight years old. I was living in Texas at the time. Uh, we spent a lot of time, myself and all of my cousins spent a lot of time at my grandparents' house in the summers. Uh, and my grandparents were pretty hands-off, so we were pretty unsupervised. And they had uh, three-wheelers. And so being the wild child that I was, I hardly ever wore shoes in the summer. I traipsed absolutely everywhere. Uh, through the woods, snake and spider infested, rocks, thorny, no shoes ever. And I was riding a three-wheeler. I know how, how terrible this sounds, but you know, I was a kid and I was unsupervised, but I was riding a three-wheeler with no shoes on. We cut across a pasture that had a large patch of uh, metal in it. And the combination of being barefoot and driving probably way faster than I should have, because that was my tendency, and going through this patch of nettle, my foot blew up, like absolutely blew up like a giant football. I couldn't even come close to getting a shoe on it. And I ended up having to um, go to the doctors with my grandparents. And uh, that was my first experience of this plant. Typically, um, when you come in contact with, the, with this plant, you're not gonna have that strong of a reaction. I do know some people that are extremely sensitive to it. Now, when I come in contact with it, I'll just get some mild to intense itching um, and kind of a sting that's associated with it. I think that my initial reaction to it had something to do with um, how fast I was going on the four-wheeler and maybe the amount of contact that I made with it. But this one tends to pop up um, in my flower beds. Uh, so I, I, I bump into and reacquaint myself with it every single year. 
It's now um, taken up residence in my compost bin as well. And it is amazing how tall this plant can get uh, when it's uh, left to its own devices and it's in uh, like a high quality nutrient rich soil. I, I will say that there have been years that maybe I haven't addressed it as early as I should have and I had you know plants that were like five, six feet tall. So if you're gonna um, harvest and work with this plant, um, certainly you need to be wearing gloves, like really high quality gloves, or you're gonna get some mild to serious skin uh, irritation. It's best to um, use it in the spring. Not that you can't use it later, I should say, depending on how you're gonna use it. If you're going to use it as a food, um, it's best to use it in the spring when it's quite tender. Um, medicinally, it can be used at later times in the season. If you're really kind of harvesting, one of the, the nice ways to do it is to just sort of be clipping off the top. So it's always kind of putting up new fresh shoots kind of in the upper, uh, uh, upper portion there. Um, this plant uh, reproduces through rhizomes underneath the ground, so it's really easy uh, to get a little cutting from it if you want to start some. Be really, really mindful, however, if you want to start some on your property because it, it can be very spready and can be quite invasive and potentially inconvenient to have it in places that you don't want it. Um, because of the rhizomes, it does, you know, it kind of it will get in an area and then it's really, really hard to eradicate, which is why I keep running into it in my flower beds. Um, so this plant can be used both as food and medicine because it is so nutrient dense. Um, you're probably wondering, I'm just talking about how irritating it is, and then we're talking about eating it, um, either drying the plant material to work with it or, or cooking, wilting it. Uh, it takes the sting out of it. So you definitely do not want to eat this plant raw, but um, with steaming it or sauteing it mildly, it actually becomes a really lovely green. Uh, one of the cool things about uh, you know, technology in this day and age is you can go online and Google, you know, whatever it is, nettle, dandelion, uh, chickweed, any of these sort of more highly nutritious uh, plants and get tons and tons of recipes. You know, wild foraging for plants has really become a thing um, and you can get some really cool ideas and recipes and ways to use this. I think in uh, one of Rosemary Gladstar's uh, books that I have, she has like a recipe for a nettle and calendula flower omelet with feta in it or something. Um, so yeah, this is a plant that can be used both as a food source and as medicine. Another way that this plant can be, can be used is it can be dried and then kind of ground, and you can use it actually to improve the quality of the soil in your garden. Um, or I know people that, that dry it and then grind up the powder and they add it to like their chicken feed for their chickens um, so that their eggs are really nutrient packed, yeah. So let's see, what else do we wanna talk about this one? Yeah, vitamin C, A, calcium, magnesium, zinc, iron, potassium, B complex, and protein, all in this fabulous plant. You just have to be really careful about how, um, how you harvest it and intentional about how you come into contact with it. Um, what else? So this can be really good for um, kind of liver disorders, uh, joint stuff it can be really good for. Primarily, I use this one for its nutritive effects, which makes it like a really nice addition uh, for somebody who's recovering from illness or, you know, has some kind of constitutional weakness going on for some reason. Also for um, pregnant and nursing mamas to help improve the quality and the quantity of breast milk. This can be a really um, great addition there. Um, yeah, it can also be really nice for some nerve stuff, you know, very interestingly, um, nerve stuff where people have lost sensation or are having kind of the tingling sort of sensations that you experience when you come in contact with this plant. If you've ever come in contact with it, it's like this kind of weird prickly tingling sensation. Well, this plant used as a tea or a tincture can actually help resolve when there's been nerve damage in an area and people either don't have sensation or they're having that kind of just like 
partial tingling sensation, this can be a really good plant for that. Um, okay, I'm looking at the time and I'm realizing that, you know, getting through this pile of plants and talking um, as in depth as I am about each one of them, we're not gonna get as far as I had planned. So I'm gonna try to focus my energy here and get us through um, at least a few more of these plants before we break at noon. So I'm gonna just keep going here and I'll address questions sort of at the end right before the break, okay? So the next plant that I wanna talk about is St. John's wort. And that one grows here. It's actually considered um, like a noxious weed. Uh, and there have been some projects where they've had, you know, people go out and do a, a lot of pulling and trying to remove this plant, which sort of brings me to um, another point that I wanted to mention to everyone that it's, you know, one thing to look at these plants, you know, on the computer, online. I found it really, really helpful at the Gunflint Ranger Station here in town. If you go into just that, you probably can't go in right now one day soon we'll be able to go out into the world again if you go just into their little entryway there they have lots of these plants that we're going to be talking about and they have them dried um, between glass um, some of them in their flowering states but all of them where you can really clearly get a nice close-up of the plant itself and the leaf arrangement and stuff and i know that early on when i was trying to um, wrap my mind around some of the Minnesota plants that were new to me. I found that super helpful. So just a little a little tip there that um, the Gunflet Ranger Station has those when things start opening back up and it's safe to kind of be going into places again that you might want to check out. It's a pretty cool resource to have. Um, so St. John's Wort. This one um, often grows, you know, again, along sides of the road in kind of rocky areas. It likes, it likes full sun kind of scenarios. And you know, the interesting thing about this plant is I find it has a pretty short harvesting window. I'll see it, you know, as I'm driving down the road, I'm like, oh, St. John's is, is um, starting to flower and it looks beautiful. It looks like it, it often grows in kind of larger colonies too. And it'll look like all of these beautiful golden yellow flowers. And then when you get out of your car and you go up <laughs> and close to them, you'll see that like almost half or more of them are actually already kind of spent. And you do want to use a little, I like to do um, whole plant preparations of this, of the aerial parts, um, but I would say it's more like 70% flowers and maybe like 30% leaves. So you really do want the flowers to be kind of an ideal condition. So you've got kind of a short little window of time. Um, this is what it looks like close up. And um, what's really distinct about this is all, all these little stamens. So one of the cool things about um, St. John's wort is back in the medieval times, um, when they were carrying around, I don't know what they were doing with it exactly, but in ceremonies, uh, a representative of the blood of Christ, this is the plant that they used. If you've ever made an oil um, infusion or done anything with this plant, it turns the, the oil or the alcohol like this dark, dark orange, almost red, color. Um, so there's kind of an interesting little tidbit of folklore on this one. Um, it can get fairly tall, about two to three um, feet tall. It's going to have this very distinctive five petals within, again, all of the, the, the little um, sepals in there. Uh, hmm, what else can I say about this one? This one's most commonly known and talked about for depression. Um, I think, you know, sadness, those kinds of things, but it's also a really great one for wound care and for pain just in general, just in general. This is a really great one for pain, especially I would say in injuries where there is a sharp shooting pain. So think like um, carpal tunnel or sciatica, that kind of stuff. And you could do a couple of different things. You could take it internally, but you could also do like a, an oil of it applied or a salve, um, take it a step further and process it into a salve externally on those places to help to deal with that kind of sharp shooting pain. Um, I think I talked about, you know, it pairing well with some of the plants that we talked about. Fibromyalgia, this is a really lovely one if you or someone you know um, suffers with fibromyalgia, infusing the, the flowers and a small amount of the leaves in an oil to use um, to massage on areas and joints that are painful. 
this can be a really lovely plant for this one. You do want to avoid this one if you are on um, blood thinners. And this plant can create something called photosensitivity or photodermatitis, uh, meaning if you're taking the, the plant, some people, um, when they go out in the sun, they'll get some sensitivity in the skin, sometimes even like a little bit of a rash. It doesn't affect me in that way, but it's common enough that it's something that you should be definitely be aware of. Other things that this is really good for um, applied externally, it can be good for um, kind of painful rashes, more like eczema, psoriasis sort of thing. Internally, kind of like think internal wounds, it can be good for like ulcers or um, kind of healing that's needed within the digestive system. As I mentioned, kind of to start, it does have sort of a reputation about being good for um, depression. Uh, it can be a nice one to add into like a sleep formula sometimes as well. Mm, yeah, I think maybe just to kind of keep things a little bit more abbreviated. That's all I'll say about, about this one. And then let's look at self heal. Uh, yeah, or all heal. You probably all have this one growing um, in and amongst your lawn. It's probably not up quite yet. Maybe those of you that are closer to town, um, it might be starting to show up. Not quite out in my yard yet. Um, it can go like kind of unnoticed in, in the yard until it starts to put up these little um, kind of purple flower things. And, you know, from just a passerby sort of observation, it looks like a pretty nondescript little purple flower. But I'm hoping that you can see in this little bit more close up, they're actually, again, kind of like the jewelweed flowers. They're these tiny, beautiful, almost orchid-like uh, little purple flowers that get arranged sort of around there. Um, this plant's called Pernella, but most often people are, will call it self-heal or all-heal. Uh, I've also heard it called woundwort, so I'm going to give you a little glimpse into what it's good for there. Um, carpenter's herb, you know, because it's also another one of those that's really good for injuries that you can just find growing around and like grab when you get uh, hurt. Those are some of my favorite um, kinds of plants. So they have kind of these lance-shaped leaves. I'm hoping you can see that in the leaves there. And then these really tiny kind of um, purple, you know, variations from kind of a real light purple to almost a, a, a dark, dark purple flower on them. Um, these, you want to usually harvest when they're flowering. And I typically um, just harvest a small amount from each plant. Um, these can, it's good for kind of external sores and wounds, again. Also think internal sores and wounds, so sore throat, ulcers, any kind of issues with the gums or the mouth. Um, this can be helpful, in, you know, for different kinds of, of bleeding. Hmm. Think about what else this one can be really helpful. So this one with uh, yarrow is a really nice combination and I'll talk about, I'll give you a couple of recipes kind of towards the end of this afternoon's class to you about a few things that work really well and some nice combinations that are easy to make and are all things that you can kind of go out and gather. Um, yeah, uh, one of the other things, and I haven't ever used this one this way, but uh, that an herbalist friend of mine told me was that combining this one with rose and applying externally can be really good for headaches. And I haven't used it that way, but it's, a, it's another look at it uh, that could be interesting, especially if you're somebody that, that deals with headaches or has someone in your family that does. Okay, great. So let's um, let's keep going. Uh, we're going to talk about mullen, hmm, right? That's a really great one right now. So there's this interesting thing. Ooh, I can't click this guy out of the way um, to get to my next picture. Let's see. Nope, that's bone set. Um, shoot. Sorry, guys. I'm trying to navigate to the next photo here and um, have a little. There we go. Oh, and I just closed it. Shoot. All right. Well, um, catnip. 
I'm not going to be able to pull it up. Okay. Well, I will, I will pull up a photo of, of this one for you guys um, at the break and show it to you. So mullen is the next one that I want to talk about. It's a pretty distinct plant. If you live up here, you've probably seen it. One of the interesting things, that's not what the picture is on the screen, by the way. The plant you're looking at is not mullen. So if you're not familiar with it, that's not it. Um, I'll put up a picture of of mullen uh, when we come back from the break. So the interesting thing about mullen is it's a biennial. So it, it looks really different in year one versus year two. So in year one, it's gonna be a very kind of low growing, I would call it like a rosette of um, really soft, um, I think one of its nicknames, even though it's not this plant, but that it's sometimes called is like lamb's ear. It has that sort of fuzzy uh, sort of feel to it. In its second year, it's gonna put up a really tall, really, really tall, like I've seen this plant get like six feet tall, really, really tall um, center stalk that's then covered in little individual yellow flowers, but they're clustered all around it. So last year we had a huge amount of mullen growing. I had conversations with lots of herbalists about, wow, have you guys noticed how much mullen is growing? very interestingly, and we see this kind of happen in cycles um, within the herb world, is that quite often there will be an abundance of a plant, and then afterwards we'll see um, an abundance of illness that calls for that plant. So mullen is a plant that has an affinity for the lungs, right? This last summer there was more mullen than I've ever seen in my whole life, um, just growing abundantly everywhere. And now here we are working with something that we're seeing really settles into and affects the lungs. Very interesting combination there. So mullen has a strong affinity for, um, for the lungs. Like I said, it's got kind of the soft hairs. Um, first year, it's gonna be that very low growing kind of rosette. The second year, it's gonna send up this really big spike. On the spike is where then the, the seeds form then it reseeds and kind of continues its, um, its process. So you can harvest the leaves from both the first or the second year plant. Um, if you're gonna harvest the leaves from the second year plant, I would recommend harvesting them before the stalk pushes up and especially before it goes to flowering, right? It starts uh, rerouting, uh, redistributing the energy towards flowering and creating seeds. So if you're gonna be, um, Harvesting leaves of this one, you want to try to do it before it starts shifting that energy there. You can use both the flowers and the leaves. The flowers I like to use um, for things around earache. It's a really, really um, well-known um, earache remedy. Sometimes paired with garlic, you will make an oil of mullen flowers and garlic and use it for uh, earaches. But even without the... Um, garlic, it's, it's a pretty amazing um, ear remedy. Whereas the leaves, you're gonna use more, as I kind of said, for sort of lung stuff. It's got such an affinity for the lungs, um, honestly, that I've seen this used by herbalists in um, smoking blends to kind of help people stop smoking, where they take them off of sort of the, the nicotine um, to start and give them some sort of an herbal blend to smoke, to kind of help them break the habit, um, that both, you know, transitioning off the nicotine is helpful in healing, but then also adding plants in that have an affinity for helping to heal and clear the lungs. So I've seen it used in that way, but it's really great in teas or tinctures, um, any kind of lung support formulas that you want to put together. Um, what else would I say about this one? Mm -hmm. A flower essence, which we don't have a lot of time to talk about flower essences, um, but these are very like subtle energy uh, medicines. You can make a flower essence out of the mullen flowers that helps one um, who's struggling with like indecisiveness or trusting their own inner voice. And that can be made, again, it's a totally different form of medicine making. It's very subtle vibrational energy, but it can be really fun to work with. Um, and that's just using the, the teeny tiny little yellow mullen flowers again. Yeah, so for some people, the little fine hairs on mullen can be a little bit aggravating. So um, either if dry the plant material completely first before using it, 
or if you're gonna use it fresh, like using the fresh leaf to brew a tea, for example, um, I would maybe strain it through like a coffee filter or something after it's brewed, just to make sure, you know, you don't wanna be aggravating the, the esophagus or um, the digestive system while you're trying to help heal the lungs, you know, one step forward, two steps back. So that might just be something to be aware of. If the plant material is completely dried, I have not ever experienced anyone having um, issues with it. You know, obviously people have different sensitivities. But if you're using the fresh plant material, that might be something to be mindful of. Okay, great. So moving forward, let's see here. Bone set. Bone set is the next one that I wanna talk about. So for those of you that are a little bit um, newer to plant identification, I wanna take just a little moment here to hit the pause button. <clears throat> you know, I remember being very kind of um, overwhelmed in the beginning thinking, you know, how do I know the difference between this plant and this plant? And, um, and there are some that look quite similar, some that look um, fairly similar and mistaking one for the other might not be a problem. There are some uh, medicinal plants out there that have lookalikes that are poisonous. This isn't the case with this one. I didn't include any of those in this kind of introductory sort of thing. But certainly once you go exploring outside of the realm of the ones that we're introducing today, it's really good to know if there are false versions or lookalike versions, especially if they are poisonous. It's something to know. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in wild crafting. But I do just wanna take a little bit of a pause here to talk about just plant identification in general. Um, my recommendation, if you're gonna start going out wild crafting, you know, one of two things, go out with somebody who knows the plants and um, can really help you identify them in the beginning or buy yourself a really great plant identification guide and start to get to know um, kind of like a series of things. So like starting with the flowers, know, you know, for sure what color it is, if there's ever any variations in the colors, but then starting to get specific, like are the flowers on bone set, for example, are they single flowers? Are they cl clusters of flowers? Are the flowers flat or are they rounded? Uh, let's talk about the stem. You know, is it a single stem that comes up? Does it, is it spread and it's quite branchy? Is it a round stem? Is it a square stem? So most of the um, plants in the mint family are gonna have square stems. So if you're trying to uh, identify something that, that lands in the mint family, um, then that's a really, really helpful, useful tool. One that I find the most helpful is to start talking about the arrangement of the leaves on the stem. So there's a couple of different terms that we would use. We would talk about the, the leaves being opposite, meaning that they grow on the opposite sides of a stem from each other. There's a term that we would call alternate, where they kind of alternate. There's like a staggering of them as they go down. There's another term, and we'll get to a plant here that I can point this out to you um, shortly. It's called a whorl, where they sort of grow in a circle, even with each other, kind of all the way around the plant. Um, or there's this type which is why we're kind of pausing here. And it's called perfilate. And it looks like it's similar to opposite, meaning they're growing across from each other, but opposed to having like a little stem that comes off of the stem. And you can see that there's these two clear leaves that are just growing opposite of each other. Kind of the fat or the butt end of the plant or the leaf is growing right up next to the butt or the kind of uh, flat part of the other leaf. And it sort of looks like until you look really closely, that it's actually one continuous leaf that goes out of both sides, that the stem is just running through the center. So if you know that you're looking for a plant, let's say in this case, this is bone set, it looks maybe to the beginner's eye a little bit like yarrow. You know, well, the flowers, they're both white, they both grow in clusters, um, the stems are both round, they're both branchy. Now we get to the leaves. As we talked about with yarrow, there, yarrow's got many leaves, right? It's called thousands of leaves, and they're quite feathery. These are perfilate, right? So, ah, now all of a sudden, what went from, I'm not sure which plant this is, you can kind of start breaking it down and then get to a place where you feel 
confident, more confident, sure, depending on <laughs> where, where you are in your level, that this is indeed the plant that you're, that you're looking for and that you're hoping to identify. So um, that is something that I would recommend for everybody. If you're not familiar with those terms, um, just get yourself a good, even like wildflower um, plant, any kind of you know, plant identification guide and start to learn about those terms and then find one or two distinct uh, qualities about the plant. So in my mind, I've always thought about it this way. Let's say that I am friends with two identical twins. They look almost exactly alike. But if you've ever had friends that are twins, it'll be like those one or two telltale signs, you know, whether it's a little freckle here or, um, you know, I, I don't want to say like length of hair because that's something that could change, right? And just like with a plant, it could be a little taller than it normally is, or the flower could be a little different color. So you kind of want it to be something that's sort of standardized. So, you know, oh, that's, that's this one because it's got this very distinct marker. And I kind of do the same thing with plants and I would recommend that for you as well. Okay, without spending too ter terrible uh, much time there. So bone set. So bone set is in the aster family. Um, and we have lots of um, asters that look kind of similar to it with like the little bit of the purplish um, color to them. We're gonna use the, the aerial parts. So all the parts above ground, specifically the um, flowering top here. Mm. The leaves, they kind of taper to this, you know, that's another thing you can get really specific about the leaves too, is that these kind of taper to what I would call like a finely, um, a fine sharp point. And then it doesn't show it, oh look, I can blow it up. It doesn't show it super great, but if you can really start to look at this, you can see that the edges of the leaves are ever so slightly finely toothed. So that would be another like great distinctive thing that you could know about the plant. Like, I've got these two plants that grow here, sometimes side by side. Um, they look pretty similar. Ah, let me get down to the leaf. It's perfilate, it's finely toothed, bone set for sure, okay? Um, what do we wanna say about this one? So this one is interesting and I put it in the mix um, today because this was the plant that sort of everyone relied on during the 1918 flu pandemic. This was the one um, that everybody kind of leaned into and was using. Uh, this one is great for cold and flu kind of stuff, especially the cold and flu kind of symptoms where there's night sweats um, or a lot of heat in the body. It can be good for stuff like bronchitis, um, any kind of pulmonary inf inflammation. Um, it also has kind of a, a mild relaxant quality. So it can be good for like very um, spasmodic kind of cough sort of stuff or um, in muscle tissue, any kind of smooth tissue where there's kind of spasming happening. So maybe um, you don't have anything else on hand and you've been working outside and you've got kind of a muscle spasm going in your shoulder because you overused it. Or maybe it's more in the form of like a cough that you just you kind of get in a coughing fit. You can't quit. Bone set would definitely be um, a good one to reach out to for that. Its name, bone set, right? It, it gets that because um, it does help to regenerate um, cells and was very traditionally and is still traditionally used by some um, on, on injured uh, musculature or broken bones. Usually a combination of taking the tea internally and then making some kind of a poultice externally. So I have um, herbalist friends who use this plant alongside with comfrey externally. They'll take the two um, plants and kind of um, like run them through a food processor or something and make like the equivalent of pesto. So you've got kind of like this, this mush <laughs> and, and apply it over the area and then uh, wrap it in a bandage and change that several times a day. Certainly in an emergency situation, you could do it with just the fresh leaf um, and some of the crushed flowers as well. But you know, probably more ideal if you could take some of the plant material back, kind of um, emulsify it together and then apply it externally, we're talking about here, and kind of wrap it. It's um, really been shown to, to help speed up the healing process in both bone and um, muscle injuries there. Uh, let's see, what else? So paired with mint, maybe some yarrow, uh, maybe throw some rose hips in. It could be really good for colds and flu. 
um, paired with something more like catnip, which we have growing wild here as well, um, for relaxing sore muscles or if you had like a strain. Mm. Butterflies love this one too, and we'll talk about this a little bit when we start um, talking about creating a uh, medicinal garden. Um, I love to not just um, plant things that are helpful and nourishing to myself, but also plants that nourish the land, maybe that like help fix uh, nitrogen in the soil or that support um, the wildlife that is around or the pollinators. So this is re a really lovely medicinal that is also loved by butterflies um, that you can bring into your garden. Okay, goodness. Well, it is 12.01. I still have a stack of plants here that I would love to talk to you about. So I'll reassess that over lunch. Um, how about this? We'll go ahead and we'll take lunch. Actually, let me just check. There's something in the Q&A. What kind of lung conditions would mullen be good for? Yeah, um, right, because then we have to start getting a little bit more specific about um, lung conditions or types of coughs, right? There are um, dry coughs, there are spasm spasmatic coughs, there are very wet coughs. So <clears throat> um, I think of mullet as being very demulcent and having a lot of um, mucilage. So I would feel like it would be better for like dry coughs or, um, or a non-productive cough, something that, that like you're just coughing and coughing and coughing, but having kind of a hard time getting things to move versus a real wet kind of damp cough. Um, hopefully that's helpful. I mean, again, that's kind of another sort of um, branch of herbalism and how we would look at symptoms and how we would uh, put together a formula that would be much more specific to that. But that's a great question. And that is something that you um, really need to look at when you're choosing a plant, because saying that um, it has an affinity for the lungs, for example, there's lots of different conditions that arrive from different states in the body um, that perhaps one plant would be um, better than another. Yeah, so great question. Thanks for, for asking that um, and having me touch on that a little bit. Okay, so question and answers, um, at least for the moment, are clear. If you have stuff that you wanna type in there over the lunch break, I'll be sure to address those as soon as we come back. Let's take a nice one hour lunch break so that you can both nourish yourself with some food, maybe step outside, get some fresh air, connect with nature. If you live a little closer to the lake than I do, I'd invite you to explore your yard, um, your flower beds, your garden, the roadsides near your home, and things that would be coming up already that you could perhaps find. Um, plantain would be one. We haven't talked about it yet, but I'll move that to the top of the pile. Um, all heal or self heal could be coming up. Dandelions, for sure. Um, what else might be kind of starting to pop up? If you have yarrow that grows um, around, it's probably not greening up yet, but you might be able to find last year's yarrow stems. Um, they tend to dry and just stay standing or kind of tip over. So you might be able to find um, evidence that you have yarrow growing near your home, but go out and explore and see what might be already growing um, in near and around your home. And then maybe we'll lead off coming back from lunch from just talking about um, any plants that you saw out there that you were able to identify or that you know that you have um, coming up around you. So everybody, um, thanks for being here. Enjoy your lunch and we will meet back here at one o'clock and I will see you then. Take care. Bridget, unshare your screen for now. Ah, okay, thank you. I was just trying to pull up these mullen pictures. Actually, you know what? I think I'm gonna pull them up and leave them up there. Okay, I just wanted to know people could see you moving through. Okay, I, I, I won't do anything weird. That's inappropriate. <laughs>
just plant stuff. <laughs>
Hello, welcome back everyone. I know we're a little early, maybe a minute out, so um, I won't move forward with any new information yet, but just to get us caught up to speed here, the picture that you are currently looking at is the second year of um, a mullein plant. Remember we talked about it being a biennial, so this is the second year where it puts up its flower stalk. Um, I had accidentally <laughs> clicked on and deleted that picture when we were discussing the plant. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody had a visual there. I also pulled up, here we go, a picture of the first year. So I'm sure you've probably seen this one around. Um, you can see that kind of soft woolly texture of the ear. This is um, what it's going to look like in the first year. And then, like I said, the second year is when it kind of transitions into that um, big yellow standing stock. If you live on or um, ever drive kind of the west end of County Road 7, um, I'm sure you saw we had like that right before your, uh, 7 comes down to Highway 61, there were just, I mean, dozens and dozens and dozens. It looked like an army of um, mullein plants last year growing all along that area. Not that I would advise um, necessarily harvesting there in, if, if that continues to be an area of high population for them. For a couple of reasons, A, it's right by the road. Um, so you're gonna get some mm, environmental toxins from vehicles and stuff going by, but it's also right underneath um, some power lines that are running overhead there. And I try to avoid uh, harvesting on power lines where there's kind of more um, electrical toxicity as well. Yeah. Um, okay. And then I did see that somebody had posted a question in the Q&A. So I'll pop in there. Is there another name for horsetail? Um, the only other names that I know for horsetail is shave grass. Sometimes you'll see it in herbal circles called shave grass. I've also seen it called snake grass. Um, those are the only ones that I know of off the top of my head. Um, not sure if that was just out of curiosity or if you're having a hard time finding it. Um, if you're having a hard time finding it, shave grass might, is likely the other name that you'll find it under in kind of like herbal books and herbal resource centers. So hopefully that is helpful. So it's 102 now. We probably have a couple of stragglers. Um, it's, it's a beautiful day out there. Hard to make your way back in um, for class. But we'll go ahead and get started since we still have so much information to cover. Um, and we'll just let them pop in when they arrive. So welcome back. I'm hoping you guys got a chance to get outside and maybe um, explore the area around your house and see what might be emerging. If you were able to locate uh, some of the medicinal uh, herbs we've been talking about, I'd love for you to just type the names of those into the question and answer, even though it's not necessarily a question, just so we could share that with the group. But then I'm gonna go ahead, um, notice that I'm, I'm talking maybe much more about the plants than we truly have time for. And I do really wanna be able to get through um, some more of these plants. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more briefly now about the plants moving forward. Uh, the next plant that we're gonna look at here is wild catnip. Um, you can kind of look at this one, kind of one of the distinct things about this one is it has sort of a fuzzy um, underside to the leaf, which you can't see here. The leaves are going to grow um, opposite of each other and they're in kind of this heart shape. If you look, that's why I took a picture of this one um, nice and close is because you can kind of see that heart shape and then you can see how strongly toothed the edges of the leaves are. This is an amazing one for um, kids because it has a very mild, sweet flavor. Um, catnip is a really lovely one for kids. It sort of has an affinity for their um, younger, smaller systems. Um, so what would I use this for in kids? It's a member of the mint family. So things that you can think of um, mint being used for, so digestive kind of stuff, um, any kind of bloating or abdominal discomfort, it could be really soothing for that. This is actually one of the more um, relaxant uh, maybe the most relaxant of the mint family. So it can also be good um, for in kids, especially again, if there's nervous anxiety or um, kind of muscle tension, maybe even a little catnip tea, like if they were going through some growing pains would be good. Um, kind of insomnia, difficulty sleeping, that, that kind of stuff it could be good for. 
Uh, let me think what else I would use catnip for. Well, let me just speak about the sleepiness part of it too. You know, this is one of the things that um, different plants tend to resonate with our systems in different ways. So a plant that works well for one person might not work so great for the other. A good example of this is that um, I do some of my teas at the Angry Trout and I remember one year, one of the employees coming up to me because I was working at the same time. And he said, what do you put in the, I don't even remember which tea it was, but one of the teas I was currently making at the time and it had catnip and he said, what do you, what do you put in that tea? That tea puts me to sleep every single time I drink it. It's like, I can't even keep my eyes open. And it was catnip. You know, catnip doesn't affect me quite that strongly, but can be a, 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 a quite a sedative herb for some people. So just kind of know that about it. Uh, maybe try working with it in the evening first, see what kind of effects it has on you. If you're not one that's particularly sensitive to it, then don't worry about the time of day. But for people that are quite sensitive to it, just know that that's a possibility. Um, let's see. So relaxation, sleep, cold and fevers, stomach stuff. Um, like I said, it does have a very mild, uh, sweet flavor. The other um, element that this can be good for is making a natural uh, bug repellent. I had talked about some herbs kind of earlier on. I think we were talking about jewelweed and maybe cedar. Um, catnip could be another one that you might want to add into um, some kind of a, a natural bug repellent that you might want to try. Okay, wonderful. Um, the next plant, whew, we could almost do a three hour class on this one. It's chaga. Um, chaga is, you know, this happens in the herbal world where a plant kind of gains a lot of um, notoriety and everyone's talking about it and everybody's using it. It's almost like we have a herb of the year. You know, everybody's all about astragalus or everybody's all about chaga or ashwagandha to save the day, you know? Um, and it's a little bit like that right now. You know, if you do any research on chaga, everyone's talking about it being the king of herbs. Um, it does have a lot of medicinal applications. It, it truly does. I mean, it's being researched for, um, you know, different applications for cancer treatment, for HIV treatment. Um, there's all kinds of really interesting things and it, it, it grows in kind of some limited areas and we're just blessed that it happens to grow here. I sometimes don't include chaga in my presentation. I'm going to tell you why. Um, you know, we're going to talk about harvesting here in a little bit. And one of the saddest things for me, chagas are really slow growing. Um, people call it a mushroom. It's really more of like a parasitic fungus that actually um, lives on the tree, but it's often referred to as a mushroom. And it's a very, very slow growing medicinal. Mm, typically speaking, you don't want to harvest anything that's smaller than like grapefruit size. And to achieve that size, it, it typically takes about five years in ideal growing conditions. Um, and once uh, the kind of the conch, the mushroomy kind of part um, has been harvested, it can take 10 years to start regrowing if it's harvested properly. And you know, every summer I go out for a walk and I see that very recently, this is another thing, Harvesting chaga, um, it needs to happen at a very specific time of year. But I'll go on a walk in one of my favorite places. I'll notice lots of chaga. It's not the right time of year to be harvesting it. I'll tell you why in a minute here. Um, and then the next time I go on a walk there, I see tree after tree stripped, stripped clean, completely clean of chaga in the middle of the summer. And it's really sad because it's such a great medicinal. Um, it needs to be harvested at a very specific time of year. It needs to happen late, late fall after the tree is already dormant or during the winter, um, you have kind of a little bit of window there between when the tree goes dormant and when the sap starts to run in the tree again. Anything that's harvested outside of that window is pretty ineffective. It's almost 80% water content. So all of the medicinals and all of the nutrients have pretty much been flushed out of it. So it's so sad to me, um, but I've kind of started to realize that me not talking about it isn't helpful. All of the information is out there. And maybe talking about it and educating people is a better route to go with it. Um, yeah, it's been studied for all kinds of things like I talked about cancer, especially cancers of the breast, the uterus, and the stomach. Um, it seems to have an affinity for those areas. So both as a preventative and as a complementary treatment, um, there's been studies that have just shown some pretty miraculous things um, with the use. It's a great adaptogen. Um, adaptogen, that word means that it helps the body 
uh, adapt to stressors in life. So in our modern world, especially, you know, in the paradigm that we're currently in, um, a lot of our systems are in kind of fight or flight on an ongoing basis. Uh, this is a really good adaptogen, helps the body kind of respond um, with a lot more flexibility to those outer stresses. It helps to really maintain and build vitality within the body, sort of building up that basic chi. Um, so it's great for anyone who's kind of recovering from something or as a preventative to kind of build the system, you know, potentially like before a surgery or something. Uh, it can also be really immune modulating. So both tonify the immune system and kind of activate and uplift kind of a weakened immune system. So you can see even from that little snapshot, you know, not even covering all the possibilities, um, what a powerful herb this can be. Um, I just would really like to stress that if you're considering um, harvesting this plant, that you really spend some time truly researching um, how long it takes, when the right time is to do it, uh, all of those factors. I'll often see it out in the wilderness and not harvest either because it's the wrong time of year, because it's way too up, high up in the tree and I'm a fairly sharp person, so I need to come back with the right tools. It's a very hard, if you haven't encountered it, let's see. Let me pull up a picture for you here. Uh, that's the flowers off of catnip there. Let me get to this next little slide here. There we go. There we go. It's kind of this um, almost like burnt look on birch trees specifically, um, but it's very hard. So when you harvest, you don't want to harvest more than, I mean, you always want to leave at least 30% of the plant material back and it's really hard. It's like wood. So you almost have to have like a very specific knife, a hacksaw, an ax, you have to be able to be in a position where you can do that without damaging the tree. Um, so it's not something that is easy to just go out and stumble upon and just get. You need to have a lot of intention and planning around it. So I'll often go out and see it to kind of try to make a mental note of where it is, um, try to return on snowshoes <laughs> at the appropriate time. And um, if I can find it again, because sometimes, you know, it's just not intended to be harvested and I can't find it again. Or I go out and um, I'll see that the entire kind of conch has been just kind of ripped off of the tree, leaving the tree open and vulnerable to other kind of um, invasions. So if you're interested in working with this um, plant material, I would encourage you to um, really, really be mindful about how you harvest, how much you harvest, um, all of those things. And if you're buying the plant material, also, you know, really ask those questions about how it's being harvested and if it's being harvested sustainably and make choices to only get it from places where you feel like it truly is. Okay. Um, all right. So moving on, like I said, I could talk kind of all day about um, chaga. It's a, it's a pretty fascinating um, plant in the plant world. So this next plant we're going to talk about is chickweed. I went ahead and got a um, real nice close-up picture of the flowers and sort of the um, little hairs that are on it, just so that you could see that. But now let me give you kind of a broader, the, this is more so what you're going to see the plant. It kind of tends to grow in these little clusters, often in really open areas like this where there's disturbed soil. It looks a lot like initially to some people, a lot like cleavers and they tend to grow a lot side by side. So that's why I wanted to be able to give you kind of this real close up picture here so that you could kind of see some of the details and start to discern the difference between the two of them if they're new to you. Um, chickweed is another one of those very nutritious, um, nutritive food herbals. Uh, this is kind of a fun one. It comes up pretty early in the spring. Uh, as well and grows pretty fast. And this is one that I will often uh, collect when I'm out gardening and put into like a green smoothie. I've also used it to make kind of my version of an herbal green goddess uh, salad dressing too. It's just one of those exciting first of the season, yay, <laughs> the green things are growing kind of deals. Um, it's pretty abundant. The, one of the ways that you can really define the difference between this and cleavers is going to be that um, this one has opposite leaves. They're going to grow opposite of each other. 
Um, it's really high in vitamins and zinc. It's uh, good for, for external and internal inflammation. So again, you could use it on external kind of skin irritation sort of stuff where there was inflammation or internally to address um, inflammation in the you know, mouth, the throat, the digestive system. It does also have an affinity for the respiratory system. Um, things like bronchitis, again, you know, think inflammation. Uh, so it's very soothing to like burns, eczema, external kinds of stuff. Also like nettle rash, um, the rash that you would get from getting exposed to nettle. This would be a lovely one. You know, maybe this jewel weed together uh, could be a good combination. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and talk about cleavers, the one that I mentioned that looks a little bit similar to it and tends to, tends to show up nearby. And again, I gave you kind of a real close up of the flower here and then we'll, we'll back out so you can see the plant more. And just so you can see differences here, I'm gonna to toggle between the two. So this is cleavers. You can see four petals on the really small flower. It also has sort of the little, the little hairs on the plant, but then this is the chickweed. So when you really get close up, you can see that the flowers are quite different. Um, the leaves are also quite different. And then when we go again to this picture, now, the other distinguishing thing, right, is I said that um, chickweed has the leaves that grow opposite. This is what we're talking about when we say they grow in whirls. So they're all kind of at a level point on the stem and they grow around the stem. So that's a whirl. So knowing those terms and um, knowing how, how a plant grows in that way can be really helpful in distinguishing between the two. So this is what it looks like kind of in an you know, exterior sort of thing. I found it funny that this um, picture makes it look like it's growing so very upright. Um, that's not my experience of the plant. My experience of the plant is that more often or not cleavers, which is kind of the name, cleaves on to other things. So it often grows around other plants for support. If it's gonna be taller, it's usually kind of wrapped around or through the limbs. Like in my garden, I have a couple of blueberry plants and cleavers grow around the base of those and kind of use the blueberry plants to, to reach for the sky. Um, this plant is also very high in vitamin C. You know, we could consider this also a nutritive um, food um, medicinal, except it's quite tough. It's, um, it's, it's less than ideal, even early, early in the spring for eating raw. Now, certainly you could process it. Um, I like to make an early spring kind of uh, green wisdom broth, for lack of better words. You know, I'll uh, pull together a bunch of the nutritive herbs that we've talked about and just kind of make a really dense, really thick, big pot of tea, essentially, that then I will freeze and pull out um, and use it as the base for, you know, a soup or something. Um, whenever I'm doing cleansing, uh, juice cleanses or those kind of things, sometimes I'll pull it out and I'll just drink some of the broth warm too. So that's a way that you could use it, but like kind of eating the plant material, like in a salad or something, it's, it's quite fibrous in my opinion. Um, it is really good for swollen glands and has an affinity for the lymph system. So um, anytime there's any kind of swollen glands, um, mastitis, this would be a nice like external compress uh, for that. Skin stuff again, this is a good one for like psoriasis, more dry skin things as opposed to like weepy skin things though. So psoriasis, dandruff, um, eczema, again, potentially it could be a good one for like in a salve or used as a compress um, on that one. Okay, and it, you'll notice I am kind of moving much quicker through these if I'm, if I'm going too quickly or if there's um, stuff that you have questions about, just go ahead and pop them in the q and I'm gonna um, go ahead and run through just a few more herbs here and then we'll go back, revisit the Q&A before we start talking about harvesting and other things. Okay, next plant. I am one to always root for the underdog. The next plant is dandelion. I feel like it has gotten such a terrible, terrible rap. <laughs> People are constantly trying to eradicate it from their garden. Um, and you know, that's kind of a, a newer thing. It used to really be valued. Once again, it's a super nutritious uh, food source. 
and it's great in uh, dry, uh, dry, great in like fresh salads and stuff. Uh, trick there, if you've tried it and you're like, it's way too bitter for me. Um, plants that grow in the sun or later in the season are gonna tend to be much more bitter and um, tough. If you can get them first thing in the spring or even first thing in the spring growing in the shade, they'll be much sweeter and much more tender. Now, it's not just a good edible food. Dandelion, um, all parts of the plants are usable. This is another super fun one uh, to do some Googling on recipes. There's dandelion and pumpkin seed pestos out there. There's fried dandelion uh, fritters with the flour in them. I've seen dandelion wine, dandelion mead. Uh, I've seen pancakes with dandelion flowers in it. I mean, like, if you just go, if you just type in, you know, like dandelion recipes, there's pages of really exciting stuff that sounds really good. Um, as a medicinal, I think that dandelion is probably best known as like a liver tonic and um, its ability to detoxify the system. So if you're trying to clean and clear the system kind of of anything, this could be your ally, um, especially if there's a sluggish uh, liver stuff going on. It's also a really great digestive bitters. I talked about how those kind of older leaves or leaves that have been in the sun have that bit, that real bitterness to them. So using these in a digestive bitters um, formula to um, stimulate the digestive enzymes in the digestive uh, tract um, and to stabilize blood sugar can be really helpful. Um, so I talked about the detoxifying qualities of this one. So any kind of metabolic waste in the system, this can really kind of help the system clear that out. So one of the specifics on that would be uric acid uh, that tends to build up in the joints. Um, it, that, that's what gout is. So anytime that you've got stuff that's building up in the system, um, really anything, metabolic waste, it excesses of hormones in certain ways, this can really help to clean and clear things out, which sometimes can have really positive effects on the joints as well. Um, what else? Oh, there's also, I haven't ever had the chance to try this, but definitely in the um, dandelion folklore, it talks about um, if you've ever broken just like the stem that the flower kind of comes up out of the basal arrangement of leaves, there's that white milky sap that comes out that's supposed to be really good for helping to clear warts up. You just take the sap and apply it directly to the wart and it's supposed to clear it up kind of magically. If anybody tries it, let me know um, how your results are with that. Okay, uh, I've got a few more in the pile here that I really want to address. We're going to just kind of blast through these, I'll answer questions, and then we'll transition into the next stage. So the next one is motherwort. Honeybees absolutely love this one. Um, you can probably tell by the name. It has an affinity for um, females of all ages. This also is a member of the mint family. Its um, flowers are, are lobed, and the flowers themselves, oh, let's get you a picture of it. Um, the flowers themselves, Oop, that was dandelion. I didn't show that one. Here we go. Motherwort. Um, it's got these really dramatic uh, leaves that grow opposite each other. And then the flowers themselves are whirled. So the flowers grow like at these little connections where the leaves come in in a circular pattern around the stem. So very, a very distinct, re really easy way to um, identify this one. This one's great for anxiety, especially anxiety related to overthinking. Um, it can help with nervous tension. Like I said, it's kind of got an affinity for women. So um, this can be a good one for new moms that are feeling overwhelmed. It can also be um, really great kind of later in life if you've got hormone imbalances going on. Um, let me think about this, other stuff it's really good for. Oh, kind of more related on the like anxiety and nervous tension side, heart palpitations or racing heart kind of stuff. Uh, mother work can be a really good one to use for that. Okay, plantain. Shoot, everybody thinks of this as being such a simple, um, it always gets thrown into the weed. And I love this plant. I'm an avid gardener. And I think this is gardener's best friend. I leave, intentionally leave a plantain um, growing in almost every single flower um, bed and garden bed that I have, because I can't tell you how many times I've been in the garden, stuck my hand in, in a nettle, 
or gotten stung by a bee and been able to just pluck a, a leaf off of the plantain. You want to get one that's not been pushed out in the dirt, that's pretty clean. I'll put it in my mouth. I'll chew it up really quickly just to kind of bruise it, put it directly on the bee sting or on the nettle um, sting that's happening. And it is miraculous. And I'm not just saying that from my personal, <laughs> my personal experience. Um, anybody in my family, I've probably chewed up and put slobbery planting on, or if they were squealing too much, made them uh, chew it up themselves and put it on. But it's, it's really a fabulous one to have around. So um, ways to kind of have that available to you year round is to um, take the leaves of the plant, bruise them nicely, and then submerge them in oil and make an oil infusion. Um, we don't have a lot of time during kind of this abbreviated class to go into that, but you can certainly get that information in any kind of an herbal book or you know, even Googling it online, or potentially we could you know, take another step with our um, herbal learning here through CCHE and um, be able to talk more about uh, creating tinctures and salves and oil tincturing and all of that stuff at a future date. But that's one that I like to have around all the time. It goes in my, um, again, that kind of wilderness herbal first aid kit. It's just a small bottle of plantain uh, oil that I've made. So um, it's it's um, not only super soothing, it's it's almost got like a drawing agent in it. So when you put it on the bite or the sting, or I've heard of people even using it like in a drawing salve for splinters and those kind of things. It actually draws out kind of the toxin or the splinter or the um, sting or the plant material that's causing the irritation, which is why it's so very effective. And this is another one that like out in, out in the wilderness, I would definitely, if I didn't have like yarrow available to me, if I had um, kind of a, a scrape or you know some bleeding, something like that, I would use it just like as a green bandaid. Again, bruise it a little bit, put it right on top of the. Um, Bridget, the yeah. Can you put? Can you change the picture to the plantain picture? Thank you. Of course I can. There we go. Here's plantain, everyone. <laughs> I'm trying to move through these plants efficiently and not multitasking very well. I apologize for that. I'll try to be better. Um, so this is the plantain plant and you can see it's um, very deeply veined and you'll get a lot of varieties in size on these. So within my lawn, so to speak, in my, in my yard, um, they'll stay really pretty close to the ground until they put up these uh, seed stalks and the leaves will stay fairly small. However, the ones that I let thrive in my garden beds, sometimes the leaves will get huge and um, like the whole plant can almost be like the size of like some of my smaller cabbages, like very large, very robust, like a, a big leaf that would you know, cover the entirety of my arm at times. So there can be a lot of variations in, um, in, in the size of this based on, you know, if, if it's undisturbed and has the ability to do so. So then this is the other kind of notable um, on plantain at some point during the season, it's going to put up this little seed stock. There are, before it goes to seed, these little tiny, mm, I would call them flowers. They're very, very small, but they are truly a flower. Um, and then they go into this seed. If you've ever used psyllium, these little seeds are typically what's used um, and sold as psyllium. And these seeds have been ground into flour um, throughout history. They found uh, these seeds um, mummified or in medicine bags during um, archeological digs and stuff. Pretty cool um, stuff. But yeah, the, the leaf is primarily what I use and work with and primarily for um, what I had talked about. Um, also, uh, it's internal. Again, you can think internal wounds. So if, if I had stuff going on like in the mouth or the gums, I've, I've heard of um, people using it for kind of irritation, inflammation in the gums, even like abscess kind of stuff. I mean, certainly if you have an abscess, I think that um, getting to a dentist right away is like your best course of action. But as a complementary, as you're trying to draw some of the toxins out, you know, perhaps you would want to use some, some uh, plantain that had been tinctured um, to do kind of a, a mouthwash or something with. That's, that's a possibility there as well. All right, so I'm going to remember this time, red clover. Here we go, red clover. Everybody's seen red clover before, I'm sure. It grows pretty prominently up here as well. 
It's got those really distinct leaves. Um, you want to harvest the flowering tops when they're looking like this. Um, you know, they kind of start to brown a little bit as they start to deteriorate. So you want to get them when they're nice and vibrant, full of life. Um, what can I tell you about red clover? Uh, so the kind of very distinct, like three little leaflet um, sort of thing. The flower has, it's somewhere from round to kind of like an oblong avoid of egg shape sometimes. This is another one that's really great for detoxification. Um, so, you know, if you're trying to clear things out of the system, the combination of this and some dandelion root, maybe um, I would use, could be a really lovely blend there. Also a good um, respiratory tonic. So um, tonic is, is, you know, a little more all encompassing sort of um, supportive for it, not so much in like a very specific respiratory way, but could be a good kind of background herb to be in a formula for the respiratory system. Um, it also is a blood builder. So this is another one that can be good to put into a formula, like a tea or something for new moms or somebody who maybe just went through surgery or um, is anemic. If you're wanting to really like build up the blood for somebody, it's also very, very high in photoestrogens. So, um, you know, there's a couple reasons why you might want to know that. On the like helpful note of um, phytoestrogens, this can be really nice um, when people are going through perimenopause or menopause to help with um, night sweats or hot flashes, something like that. On the other kind of um, side from, from, from the phytoestrogens, uh, you would want to know that maybe somebody who had just um, gone through uh, working with breast cancer or was currently dealing with or had a history of like uterine fib fibroids, you would want to avoid using um, red clover. So just knowing that they're very, very rich in phytoestrogens and then needing to make that decision if that is um, supportive or should be avoided within the system, depending on the, the client or the person that you're working with would be important to know there. All right, um, these are another one that you can kind of see by looking closely at the flower, um, how it, there's the possibility for it to capture all kinds of moisture in there. So another one, you don't want to necessarily uh, harvest in the heat of the day, but you'd like for some of that um, initial like morning dew to kind of burn off before you um, moved into trying to dry them. Otherwise you just might kind of have some struggles and lose some of your plant material to mold there. Okay, all right. Last plant I'm gonna throw out there before we transition. <laughs> Hope, hopefully you're staying with me. I know I'm just like racing through these right now. So the last one I wanna talk about is red raspberry. And I put the photo up here without um, kind of the telltale fruiting parts because it's a little harder to identify in this stage. Um, so a, a couple of things that help, can help be helpful in identifying this one. So the toothed edges, they grow, the leaves grow in groups of three. And then on the bottom, they have kind of that um, silvery underside that can be um, very telling. Excuse me, once they start to fruit, um, you know, it's much easier. But again, if you're going to be harvesting the leaves, you kind of want to get to them before um, they're flowering and fruiting, or potentially um, you could do a second harvest again at the end of the season after they've already moved through the cycle of producing the flowers and putting their energy into the fruits themselves. Um, so what is this one good for? Uh, this is also another uh, women's uh, herb, not that men can't use it. It just has an affinity for women and for the reproductive um, system. It's a uh, very uh, tonic and tonifying to tissues. Another great one for, for new moms. It also has a very astringent quality. So again, for like a mouthwash, for anything going on with the gums, um, you could use it externally as an astringent wash. Um, hmm, what else? The roots of this uh, were traditionally used as a cure for diarrhea. Um, so there's that, you know, harvesting the roots. I, I encourage people to be um, very conservative with root harvesting of most plants because um, harvesting or disturbing the roots is gonna cause, um, you know, uh, issues for the plant survival. If you've ever had raspberry come up in one of your garden beds or in one of your flower beds, 
uh, you probably know it's a very prolific rooter. <laughs> it's got really long, extensive. Um, so being able to go in digging kind of far from the plant and taking out a root section um, would not necessarily mean the demise of a, of a raspberry plant in this one. Yeah. Um, the other thing about this is it's got a lot of calcium in it. We're talking primarily about leaves again here. It's got lots and lots of calcium in it. So um, potentially for uh, building the bones, uh, supporting you know strong teeth, strong bones. Uh, it's got very very rich in calcium. Yeah. Okay. So there's just a little window. I'm not even sure how many herbs we covered there, um, but that's just a tiny window into. Like I had said I mean I can think of probably about 120 medicinal plants. Um, ones that we didn't cover. I mean we'll just start with all the trees. Right, there's um, pine, cedar, juniper, um, touched on raspberry, uh, other plants, uh, arrowhead that grows up here, bloodroot, got a little list here, um, blue, flag, blue flag irises, cattails, bunch berries, dock, uh, evening primrose, purslane, sheep sorrel, thistle, wild sarsaparilla, um, birch trees, forget about that one, usnea. Um, another really slow growing one, please be very thoughtful about um, har harvesting it. I, t I tend to generally wait and go out looking um, after like a big windstorm uh, when it's been kind of knocked down out of the trees and collect and harvest that way. Uh, ghost pipes, cohosh, vervain, burdock, uh, butterfly weed, Solomon seal, erva ursi, winter green. I, and again, I mean, that's where it's just the tip of the iceberg. You know, here are my thoughts on that, though. Um, I feel like learning about herbs is, um, it's, it's like forming a relationship. So the example that I would say here is that, um, let's say that somebody new moved to town and um, she's also passionate about herbs and maybe she practices yoga and I've had three of my different friends or acquaintances who have, you know, ran into her or met her tell me about her, okay? So I know her name, I know her interest, I, I know where she used to live um, and that she's moved here, maybe something about her family that people have told me. So I know of her, but I do not know her, okay? So all this information that you can roll out about plants, you now know of them. But it's not really until we bump into them at the co-op and um, get to have a little chat, maybe exchange phone numbers and have tea a couple of times, that you really get to know them, right? And I, I view um, working with medicinal plants very much in that way. You know, you can read as much as you want in books. You can listen to this. You've had an introduction now, you know of <laughs> these plants, but to really get to know them, um, I suggest take a small handful of them, you know, three to five plants that are really resonating with you. And now take the next step in really getting to know them. Go out into nature, um, look at them, you know, take your, take your notes about how the leaves grow and when they flower and what the, what the best parts to use for medicinal work are and when you should harvest and kind of all of those things. Um, buy some of the plant material if you're not super comfortable with harvesting right away and you're not sure about your identification, start drinking a tea of them. Sit and do meditations with the plant. Um, out in nature or with the cup of tea, with the plant material, uh, start using the plant itself. Learn about how it feels in your body, what effects you're noticing. Um, when I try it with a, a cough that's very dry versus uh, a cough that is kind of wet and mucusy, like how does it feel like it works better? You know, there's lots of information you can get from other people and from other people's experiences. But what's really important is to start getting in there and having the experiences yourself. I, I think of herbalism as being a very experiential based art. Um, so that's what I would encourage. Um, pick three to five of these and now take the summer to really uh, develop and form relationships with these plants. Okay. All right, so uh, what's next? Wild crafting. Um, I, can't, I can't present all this information about these lovely plants that we're so blessed to have growing here in our environment without talking about um, sustainable and um, thoughtful wild crafting. So uh, let's, let's say that, you know, for me, wild crafting is very much about being a caretaker of the land. Um, 
And what that looks and feels like for each of us is going to be very different. But I would really highly um, encourage each of you to think in terms of reciprocity, um, whether that means that, you know, on days when you go out wild crafting, you're very thoughtful about picking up any trash that you encounter along the way. Or I have a friend who um, has a, a deep connection with the trees. And so anytime he sees, you know, a broken branch that's fallen or a trunk that's, you know, from one tree that's fallen over and is kind of pushing against another tree, he'll remove that broken branch or take that part of the tree that's, you know, now pushing on another living tree um, so, that it, so that it can grow, you know, more abundantly. Oh, whatever it is that, that feels and resonates for you, I would really encourage you to see um, the times that you go out wild crafting as um, being a thoughtful caretaker of the land. Um, in addition to that, you know, encouraging you to, to really walk softly, uh, to, to know whose land you're on when you go, if it's not your own, making sure that you have permission. I had talked a little bit earlier about not harvesting next to roads or under power lines. You really want to avoid taking a medicine that you're going to be putting into your body or on your body to try to create health and wellness from coming from a state of contamination. So I avoid harvesting under electrical lines. I avoid, uh, for the most part, harvesting anywhere like right near a road. The other thing living here in Cook County that you might want to consider is that some of these plants I've mentioned um, can have a tendency towards mold. So uh, flowers that are really compact and have lots of places to kind of hold moisture or the plants that have kind of um, lots of furry little hairs on them, they tend to hold moisture and have more issues with mold. So you don't wanna necessarily harvest those right next to a very dusty dirt road because it's gonna require you to then wash the plant material when you go home, putting a lot of moisture back into it and you're gonna have more issues with mold. I, for the most part, like to harvest my plants from uh, areas where the material is mostly clean and does not necessarily need to be um, washed or like submerged in water that it could maybe just be brushed and checked for debris um, before you start drying. So that would be something else to consider. You know, of course, making sure that 100% you know that the plant that you are harvesting is the plant you're intending to harvest, whether that means taking a book along with you or taking someone else that um, can positively ID the plant in the beginning, um, whatever that looks like for you. Um, I certainly know that in the beginning um, I would be out and I would see a plant that I was pretty sure. Um, now in our days of uh, having our phones with us all the time, you could easily snap a picture of it and then take it home and compare it to things. Back in the day before we were all walking around with cameras in our pocket, I would just um, pinch like a, a leaf off of it, <clears throat> make note of the stem and other you know, kinds of things about it, and then bring it back and might kind of make some comparisons um, that works as well. As I said, make sure you have permission to be where you are and that you know whose land you're on when you're gathering. Um, be prepared. <laughs> this is one I say mostly from experience. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've been out doing, you know, X, Y, Z, and then I find myself deep in the woods or in some really muddy, murky situations because I found a plant or you know, decided to do harvesting and I've got, you know, mud up to my knees and I'm wearing a sundress or I have sandals on and I'm getting thorns all over my legs. So I'd encourage you to, um, to be prepared to, to dress appropriately, have sturdy shoes on. Uh, whenever I go out, I like to have a harvesting basket with me. I like to have um, some kind of scissors or a small knife. Uh, sometimes some gloves is a good idea. If it's something that you think you might be digging a little roots, having a little hand trowel. Another thing that I always do is I keep a little tin of tobacco and um, I always make an offering to the plant that I'm gonna be harvesting from before taking any material. So having something like that, if I catch myself out in the woods without um, tobacco, then I'll sometimes make an offering of some water out of my water bottle. I think I've left like a corner of my Luna bar <laughs> before. Um, but again, that, that reciprocity, that give and take, that, you know, honoring the gift that you're receiving, saying thank you. Um, what else would I like to say about this before we move on? Oh, another big one is making sure that if you're out harvesting 
the plants that you have, the materials that you need, and a plan and intention for what you're going to do with them when you get home. I can't tell you how often in the beginning I would um, go out and I would come across something, I'd be so excited about it, I would harvest stuff and I would come home and, oh, I actually don't have enough jars or shoot, I don't have, I thought I had more oil that I was gonna oil tincture it in or I actually don't have any brandy on hand. Um, and it's not common, but there are a, f a few plants and it's good to be aware of that um, you really, really need to start um, processing the plant fairly soon. Some of them, once they start to wilt and deteriorate, they can actually form like a mild toxicity in it. So you just want to have a plan, you know, if you're going to take them home and you're going to dry it, or if you're going to, um, you know, step into tincturing or doing something different, just make sure you have the materials and the time to do it as soon as you get home. Um, one of the things that I wanted to share with everybody is uh, from one of my favorite books. If you haven't read it, it's uh, called Braiding Sweetgrass. It's a really lovely collection of stories that a woman who is an ethnobotanist wrote. And so each of the stories has a different plant kind of woven into it. Uh, it's a really lovely read. But <clears throat> she presents the idea of something that I've seen elsewhere of the honorable harvest. And I just really liked how she presented it. And I wanna share it um, with all of you because I think there's something so important about um, moving in this way. So it says, ask permission of the ones who, whose lives you seek, abide by the answer. Never take the first and never take the last. Harvest in a way that minimizes harm. Take only what you need and leave some for others. Use everything that you take. Share it as the earth has shared with you. Be grateful and reciprocate the gift. Sustain the ones who sustain you and the earth will last forever. So a couple of key points here, um, you know, the asking permission, like if you're on someone else's land, yes, asking their permission, but also asking permission of the plant that you're intending to harvest and honoring the answer that you get. If you get a hard no, there's probably a reason for that. You know, that um, particular cluster might be struggling for a reason that you don't understand. There might be contamination there that you're not aware of. Um, it might be the wrong time of year and, you know, you just have forgotten that. There's, there's lots of reasons why you might get a hard no. So I'd really encourage you to listen to that and honor that. Um, harvest in a way that minimizes harm. I spoke about that just a little bit earlier. Um, there are some of the more delicate plants or um, plants that grow in kind of disturbed soil. You want to be really careful when you're harvesting. Um, if you're not, you can uproot them and really disturb. Um, know how the plant reproduces as well, being aware of that, um, you know, harvesting the top of the plant if it uh, reproduces by spreading roots or rhizomes, not such a big deal. If it's um, counting on producing seeds to be able to create the, the plants for the next season, you wanna make sure that you're leaving the plant or the plant population um, in a place where it can, can still seed and, and, and continue on. Uh, what else would I like to say about this? Uh, sustaining the ones that sustain you and the earth will last forever. I did also talk a little bit before just about um, planting for pollinators, um, picking up trash, you know, seeing this as a, a larger interface with the world um, in general. So most herbalists would say that anytime you come across a plant population and you're doing harvesting, that you would harvest a third of the, the plant, um, available plant material at most. Uh, depending on how long the plant takes to grow, uh, how prolific it is, uh, how common it is, I think that uh, harvesting a third is probably at the top of uh, what I would recommend. I would say that it's better to harvest uh, less from each colony or population of plants and try to make your um, harvesting a little more widespread. Um, what else can we say about that? Yeah, and I think that the other, you know, kind of important thing to, to discuss maybe just ever so briefly here is about, um, you know, this idea of, of not letting things go to waste. So not harvesting more than what you can process at any one time not harvesting more than what you can use, uh, not harvesting for the sake of harvesting, essentially. Uh, simple methods of, of preserving your harvest to make sure that you don't have waste issues 
you know, one of the easiest is just hanging things up to dry. So if you're going to do that, just make sure that they're going to be in an area where they're not going to um, get dusty or, or um, you know, like sometimes in the kitchen, you know, like, uh, grease particles and stuff in the air can kind of collect on them. So you want to um, be aware of that. I have seen other herbalists who will poke a hole in a paper bag, when you use paper, not plastic, because you don't want to be trapping any of the moisture here. And they'll, they'll bundle together kind of the stems of the material they're drying and then pull it through the hole in the paper bag and tie it up to dry. And that paper bag just helps keep it from collecting dust or anything like that. Of course, you could put the material in a dehydrator if you have one. Um, oven drying is, is something that, you know, other people do. You need to be really careful um, to not overcook the, the plant material in that. Um, it's not a method that I use often, but if you wanted to explore it and you feel confident with that, that would be an option. Again, really um, alcohol or oil tincturing are, are pretty easy methods of um, preserving plant material. You'd need to do just a little more reading or um, like I said, maybe we could do another little class here to just learn how to, to do that, the proportions and how you continue to process it after that. Um, but it's a fairly easy way, especially with plants that lose some of their potency in, in drying to kind of maintain that potency and then to have it for later use. Freezing, we talked about that a little bit. Um, either you know, fine chopping or running the plant material through a food processor or something and freezing it in little ice cube trays uh, for later use is definitely an option. Um, yeah, I mean, those are probably you know, the easier ones for getting started. Okay. Uh, let's see, anything else here? Okay, I think that kind of gives us a nice breaking point. I've seen that there are kind of a lot of questions that we're starting to build up here in the Q&A. So I'm gonna address that. And then we're gonna, we're gonna um, really dive into the uh, starting the medicinal herb garden portion of this. So let's see here. Can horsetail be used long-term externally? Yeah, I don't think there's any problem um, as long as you're using it externally. Yeah, no problem. Uh, someone's saying that they found mullen, dandelion, and violet. Yes, beautiful. Yay. Um, somebody else said that they saw wild roses. Nice. Horsetail, yarrow, jewelweed. Wow, jewelweed. That's amazing. Uh, I wouldn't have expected to see that one so soon. Uh, dandelion, mullen, bone set, and all of that just right near your house. Yeah, it's kind of amazing, really, when you start looking around. Uh, it's, it's a virtual pharmacy out there. <laughs> yeah, and then someone else said yarrow, horsetail, and plantain. That's great. Yeah, beautiful. Okay, wonderful. All right, so we've got, uh, um, I, love, I love the idea of another class on preparations. Yeah, um, or a plant identification walk and field trips. Yeah, I would be happy to do that. Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit more about um, my garden here as we're talking about creating a medicinal um, garden. Uh, it is something that I've considered at this point, not considering the wild medicinals that uh, we were blessed to um, inherit as caretakers of this land we live on. I've planted now probably somewhere in the 50 to 60 um, range of medicinal plants here. And that's 50 to 60 varieties. Um, I probably have maybe like 120 medicinal plants that um, have been planted here on our land in the last several years. I was um, looking at what I wanted to share about the medicinal herb garden part of it. And I had done a very abbreviated talk for one of our local gardening clubs on this topic. I don't, I don't know exactly how long it was ago. I think it was maybe four or five years ago. And in my notes, to them, I, I was talking to them about potentially them co-oping, you know, each person in the uh, garden group growing one or two medicinals and then being able to, to dry or preserve them and share them, you know, amongst the gardening group. One of my favorite parts of uh, doing my master herb training was that once a month we would gather uh, with everyone in the class and we would all bring an herbal preparation that we had made 
with enough to share with everybody in the class. And so we got all these different herbal preparations. It was um, a ton of fun to see the way that other people combine things and the ideas they came up with. But I was proposing this to the group and I had this little note written out in the side thing that said, one day I dream of having an herbal CSH, a community support, supported herbalism. And now I'm in my second year of that actuality. And it was just fun to look back at uh, the notes of something that was a dream five years ago that's now a reality for me. So I do have a lot of medicinal plant material here and have considered doing some, uh, uh, having people visit and come see and get to experience the plants because I really think that's the best way to learn about them. Um, okay, so starting a medicinal herb garden. So depending on where you are, let's see, maybe we want to pop out of um, stop share. We're going to move away from the plants now. Okay, great. So um, depending on where you are in your gardening journey, you know, some of you might not currently have a garden. Um, some of you maybe have been gardening your whole life. Uh, you know, we're not going to spend a ton of time about talking about like the most specific kind of nuts and bolts of gardening um, because there's lots of gardening books out there. There's lots of uh, different gardening styles at this point, right? We've got container gardening and raised bed gardening, and lasagna gardening and square foot gardening. And I don't know, there's probably a tons of others that I'm not even thinking about. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to address that piece of it too very much. Um, there's really great resources in town here. If you're brand new to gardening and you're not really sure where to start, uh, Diane Booth in her office there is a great resource. They have the ability to do soil testing, um, if that's something that you're interested in, so that you could figure out how to potentially amend your soil, uh, if that's something you wanted to do. I will say herbs for the most part, you know, we're going to talk in kind of a, a, a generality here. Herbs, for the most part, are very, very forgiving plants. Um, the, some herbalists would say that it's preferred to wild, wild craft and to get plants that are not growing in super um, nutrient dense soil because the, they tend to grow a little smaller and a little more compact, which they would say kind of um, concentrates the volatile oils and the chemical compounds in the plant. So you have a more potent plant material. So when I put in my um, medicinal herbs, I didn't do a lot of soil amending at all. We've got pretty compact, um, a lot of clay in our soil. Parts of our yard, as I mentioned before, um, are kind of considered a lowland. So I have you know, one whole section that stays fairly damp for a good part of the season. Um, so when I, and I planted directly in the ground, so I dug a little hole um, for the plants. I started most of, when I started my beginning stuff was with plants. Um, and I just put, you know, like a little scoop of a mixture of um, compost, composted soil, uh, peat, a little sand for, for some drainage. Hmm, I think that might have been just a little bit of soil and I'd mix those four things together and I just put a tiny bit in there around the plant uh, just to help it get its roots established and then mulch the area but really haven't done a whole lot with you know kind of amending the soil or doing soil testing or any of those kinds of things because they're they're pretty adaptable um, pretty pest free for the most part if you're if you're buying and planting or um, working with plants that are um, native to this area or they're cold hardy enough to just live here. They seem to be pretty resilient for the most part. Of course, there's exceptions to that, but that's kind of, you know, a generality. Um, let's say, so one thing I would definitely say, and I've kind of alluded to this uh, when I was talking about wildcrafting, is if I have one piece of advice to give you, if you're going to start a medicinal herb garden, it is to start small. <laughs> start small, keep it simple. Um, just like we talked about building the relationship with maybe three to five plants on the wild crafting side, I'd say the same thing with your um, starting medicinal herb garden, really get to know the plants, uh, take that time to develop the relationship, uh, depending on how prolific they are. I mean, three to five plants can keep you doing a lot of harvesting and a lot of medicine making, quite truthfully. Uh, so don't overburden yourself. Uh, I tend to be one that kind of goes all in. <laughs> But even, you know, this year I made a list of, I don't know, probably close to 30 new plants that I wanted to add. And then in my mind, I was like, edit. 
<laughs> let's let's go back through this and edit and we'll talk about that a little bit and i probably whittled it down to um i think maybe 10 new um varieties that i'm gonna bring in this year uh which is still gonna be like a big step you know that's about 30 30 or so plants um that i'll be adding to my gardens this year so if i can say anything it would be start small uh, in the beginning, especially if you haven't been doing any medicine making or harvesting, it's it's kind of amazing. It's so much fun. I myself find a lot of joy in doing it. And it can also be kind of a lot of work. You know, there are days that my whole kitchen and the dining room table and everything has medicine making stuff spread out and I'm trying herbs or I'm doing stuff. And um, so just, just know <laughs> that it's always best to kind of start simple with a few plants. Um, all right, we talked about Diane Booth and that resource that we have here in town. Um, yeah, so, you know, some plants are pretty compact and will grow well in uh, containers if you don't have a lot of room. Uh, some plants are pretty forgiving. They'll grow in windowsills uh, or you can put them in pots and bring them inside. You know, I don't have a lot of really great soft facing windows here. I live in a pretty tiny home. I don't have a lot of room to bring things in in the, um, in the winter. So I tend to look towards medicinals that are uh, perennials here that I can plant directly in the ground uh, that require you know, low maintenance, the, the conditions that we have here are ideal for them. I'm not struggling to try to mulch things or that I need to kind of do a lot of, of work to protect. You know, I think that if we're really looking to <clears throat> grow in this idea of sustainability, then we need to look to, to plants that naturally um, grow and thrive here in this environment. So those are kind of the plants that I tend to look towards. And outside of what already grows here, there's, again, lots and lots of options of things that you can add to get a really nice, diverse uh, medicine cabinet um, growing in your yard. So I think, you know, one of the things you need to establish going in is what's that going to look like? Are you prepared or are you interested in bringing plants inside? If not, then we're going to be looking at plants primarily that are going to grow in zone three and zone four for us here. I think um, along the shore, we have some nice little pockets and microclimates of things, but that's kind of a generality and that, was, that uh, applies for me here. I'm, I'm hoping that each of you kind of knows your own um, zone and what works on your property. If not, again, Diane Booth is a really good uh, resource for that. Um, again, checking kind of the basic needs of the plant. I'm a pretty low maintenance gardener and I look to plants that are pretty low maintenance. Um, as I said, I started a lot of stuff from uh, plants. Uh, germinating some of the medicinal seeds are going to require, you know, stratification and scarification and um, doing things like that, that I don't always have the time, energy, focus, maybe more so than anything for. So, um, you know, depending on where you lie in that, if you uh, really love the challenge of trying to sprout and start, you know, um, a plant, you know, I could give you a list of things that um, show up on the United Plant Savers. That's a great website to know about. Um, if you're going to be doing any wild harvesting, they list all of the at risk uh, medicinal plants or the to watch for potentially being at risk medicinal plants. And if you're going to be doing any wild crafting, I really encourage you to, to know that website. Again, it's United Plant Savers to go and to take a look at it and to know what, what is at risk. And um, for me, I try to avoid harvesting those plants and find other medicinals that I can use um, in their place. The other, where I was kind of headed with, if you love the challenge of gardening, would be go on that United Plant Savers and then find seeds for some of those at-risk plants and take that on as your kind of gardening challenge. Um, I'm hoping to be in a place where um, I can do a little bit more of that sometime soon. Um, but, you know, we all, we all garden and uh, like different challenges within our projects in different ways. And if that speaks to you, that's a great outlet to be able to do that. Otherwise, like if you know that you don't have running water where you live or um, that you have a very busy lifestyle, then you're going to want stuff that's a little more native and compatible here. Um, that's pretty easy and low maintenance to grow kind of in general. So checking on your zone checking kind of like your um, requirements that you have at your land. You know, I've got a really great sunny spot 
but I also have some really nice shade gardens that I can tuck things that need more shade or more damp soil in. That might not be the case where you are. If you've got a completely shaded yard or a completely sunny yard, you're maybe gonna need to look at plants that are specifically going to thrive in those areas. Um, we talked a little bit about water requirements, um, the kind of gardener that you are, you know, high maintenance, low maintenance, if you've got limited time, and then really designing and working around the space that you actually have. You know, you can have a dream of having a, you know, 30 uh, variety medicinal um, garden, but if you don't truly have the room for that, then your garden is constantly going to be overcrowded and you're going to be struggling to keep things um, thriving. So just being realistic about the kind of space and the kind of conditions that you have is, is good. All right, great. So let's see, what's next? Design. This is my favorite part. This is what keeps me sane all winter, if I'm honest. Um, getting the seed catalogs in, in the mail in that like coldest part of winter, sitting down uh, a little OCD with graph paper, drawing out the area, um, reading about each of the plants, um, how tall they get, uh, how uh, what their growth habitat or their growth um, patterns kind of are, you know, are they really spready plants? Do they need a support when they grow? Uh, do they have those rhizomes that go under the ground like mint, if you've ever grown mint and it ends up in everything, taking over everything? Uh, does it need to be exiled to a corner? Another one to really know, um, there are a few plants that I grow that are annuals. And so knowing that it's an annual or a biennial and making sure that you put those potentially towards the front of the bed or maybe towards one of the edges so that it's easy to replant that. Um, I would also say that that is likely true um, of anything that the roots need to be harvested from. So all of my kind of root harvesting um, plants and herbs are all kind of towards the end of one bed uh, at the end where I can do a lot of digging and disturbing the soil without disturbing the, the root structure of my other perennial herbs. So that's another thing to consider, um, you know, depending on how much you are into aesthetics, considering things like the color of the flowers that they put on and, you know, mixing that up as you're laying things out. You know, do they flower in the spring? Do they flower all season? Are they a summer, a late fall? And then kind of planning out your garden so that it is aesthetically pleasing in stages um, might be important to you. Maybe not, but perhaps. Uh, what else would I say? <laughs> yeah, editing. Editing is big for me. You know, even after I edit, once I do my little sketch, then kind of reality starts to come in like, oh, that's not really going to work. I have six too many plants for that new bed. Okay, do we build two new beds or do I need to edit out some more again? So kind of at each step of the game, sort of reevaluating the plants that you think you're going to put in there and editing, editing, editing. Um, another thing to really strongly consider is, uh, you know, is it going to be a raised bed? Is it going to, um, what's the bed going to, to be like? And then also considering, are you going to be ordering plants to plant? Or are you going to be trying to start seeds? If you're going to be starting seeds, are you going to be able to, do you have a place and lights and uh, grow mats and those kind of things to be able to start them inside? Or are you thinking that you're going to start them outside? You know, everybody's timing is really different. Um, I tend to be, you know, I want to get them started this year, get them started and healthy early enough that I have the, the possibility of maybe doing some harvesting in the first season. Uh, that's not true of all things. Certainly if timing's not as much of an issue, if you have the time, the patience to, to do some of those um, like scarification, stratification processes, if you've got the grow mats, if you've got the lights and you really enjoyed that part of the process, it's certainly much more economical to start by seeds um, than it is by growing plants. Um, if you tend to be on the side of not really having a lot of patience for that part of the process, you wanna get things moving and established a little quicker, then perhaps looking at, at getting you know, plants that are somewhat established to be able to put in uh, is a good option as well. You know, the other thing that's kind of important to me is being able to find sources that I, you know, again, these are, these are plant materials that I'm going to be putting in my body and of those people that I love and clients and friends of mine. So where I get them and things like sustainability and being organically grown and all of those things are very important to me. So finding really good sources 
uh, for the plant that you need. Maybe sometimes means you need to get seeds instead because you're just not finding what you need from a reliable source. So that's another thing to consider. Um, places that I would recommend looking to for seeds or for plants themselves. Um, Mountain Rose sells a lot of um, processed herbals, dry plants, but they also do have seeds for medicinal plants. Uh, Peaceful Valley is one. Crimson Sage is another company. Seed Savers is great. Fedco, if you're looking for plants of medicinal varieties, uh, Richter's is good. Uh, Strictly Medicinal Seeds is also an amazing source for medicinal seeds. So those would all be options and places to get it. I guess I would um, also like to throw in here to be really careful about buying uh, quote unquote medicinal plants from just your average nursery. Um, you know, for example, like buying an elderberry plant. Uh, there's many, many different varieties of elderberry. Not all of um, the berries can be used and have the right qualities to be used medicinally. So making sure that you're buying a um, medicinal uh, variety of a plant and not one that is really ornamental. Um, so being really sure about your source if you're going to be using them in that way is also very important. You know, other options outside of buying a plant or getting seeds is a lot of these plants, um, they, we've talked about them producing by rhizomes. Um, a lot of them, uh, you can also propagate by cuttings. Um, I can't think of the exact term for it right now, but like thyme and some of, some of the other culinary medicinal plants, you can um, tuck them back into the earth and they'll make their own little roots and then you can just clip them off. I guess it's just another type of propagating. So, you know, another thing we've got a, a pretty large amount of people on the call today is, you know, starting to look at what do we already have here available in the community that um, you can access and get cuttings from or divisions from, starting with that as your base and then rounding out what you need um, by purchasing a few plants or some seeds. You know, and I guess at this point, that's kind of, you know, what I would like to talk about, you know, as far as the planning process is, what we need in a medicinal herb garden is gonna be really different for every one of us. You know, I've had people ask me many times, you know, if you were gonna start a medicinal herb garden and you were gonna put five plants in, what would they be? Well, my answer to that and your answer to that are gonna be very different because I'm choosing plants based on A, what I have here, local, available, accessible for me to wild harvest. And then secondly, it's gonna be based on the needs of my family. You know, I want the kinds of medicines for the kinds of things that my family deals with often, which might look really, really different than what your, your family is working with and dealing with on a regular practice. So one of the things that I recommend um, before you even go too crazy, like with the planning process, is to like open your medicine cabinet. What kind of natural herbals do you have in there? What kind of things are you treating on a regular basis? What kind of stuff comes up for you? Like when you're dealing with immune stuff, um, does your family tend to have stuff settle in their respiratory or, um, you know, are you dealing with more muscle ache kind of stuff? You know, people's immune systems aren't, you know, really so much the issue, but like your husband or partner or whoever tends to overwork themselves a lot. Maybe you need things that, you know, are more towards that. Maybe um, you have a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety and tend to have insomnia. You need to be choosing plants based on the types of things that you have going on in your household and that you're looking to treat for the most part. At least that's where I would advise you to start. And then you kind of start looking to your larger family group and your community at large um, when you're creating an apothecary. But start at home, focus on the kinds of plants, the kinds of things that you need, and then start looking at, okay, so what great anxiety or calming plants grow here in our environment? Which ones are easy to grow? Which ones propagate easy that I potentially would have access to? Okay, now, you know, this other person in my house has a lot of stomach issues. What do we have available here locally that um, we could potentially use for that? What do I want to plant to round that out? What could I, you know, gather from friends and family? And that's how I'd advise you to just kind of start to build that platform for yourself. Um, let's see here. Yeah. Oh, another another important factor that is how many people are you, you know, making medicines for? Is it just you and one other person? Is it just for yourself? 
Do you want to really be able to create stuff for yourself and to be able to share with a few family members? Um, what does that look like for you? What is your long term goal? Because that also um, will affect maybe you don't just need one chamomile plant, <laughs> you might need 30 because one chamomile plant in the small amount of flowers it's going to put out maybe isn't actually going to get you as far as you need to. Um, so again, knowing, you know, are you going to need to dig the roots? Are the roots even um, mature in the first year? Is it the flowers? How prolifically do they flower? Do I need more than one of those plants to be able to make this ideal chamomile uh, tea that I'm going to be using on a regular basis with catnip to help me sleep? You know, uh, start asking those questions. Uh, write everything out, dream big, and then edit. <laughs> edit it back down. Make it simple. Uh, make it sustainable. <clears throat> um, what else do we have here? Let's see. Oh, and another thing that I didn't mention, we're kind of jumping back to this idea of drying and, and storing herbs. I have to admit that I made this mistake um, quite a few times early on. You know, you're harvesting things in nature, you're bringing it back, you're doing all this really great stuff with it. Um, and I failed to label things a few times in the beginning, thinking, I know exactly what that is. I can't forget. I won't. You do. You do. So make sure that Every plant that you put in the dehydrator, every plant that you hang up, every plant that you start tincturing um, gets labeled with the what I like to gather. Um, you need the plant name for sure, uh, what it's being tinctured in, or if there's other plants that are added to it, the date that you started it. And then I also like to have a little notebook or some kind of a little binder that I um, put information about like where I harvested it you know, potentially so that I could go back, but maybe also, you know, just in case there's any kind of issues that I, I know I harvested it from this or, oh, you know, it was overcast that day and it ended up molding on me. Another great thing to talk about there. Once you think your plant material is dry and you go to put it in a jar or in a Ziploc bag or something, I would highly, highly recommend checking on it. Like, often <laughs> in, in the beginning until you really get a feel of this. You know, I was lucky enough it didn't happen to me a lot, but there were a few things that it happened to me that I was very, very bummed about, that it got moldy and I lost, um, I lost the plant material. So that's another thing to really think about, you know, in addition to not harvesting on rainy overcast days and letting that dew dry off really making sure that the plant material is dry before you put it into an airtight container, um, labeling it, getting it out of the sun to maintain its um, potency. It's just really checking in on it and making sure that it truly is dry so that you don't lose the um, plant material that you harvested. Um, I had a little bit of chaga that I left in kind of a, a nice big chunk instead of breaking it up so that it could get more air. And um, I had a piece of that get moldy on me once. I also spent kind of like a long period of time harvesting some Vitex um, berries when I was down in Texas visiting my mom. <clears throat> we dried them, but we didn't dry them enough and um, they got moldy and I had to, I lost all of those as well. So, you know, just something to know, learn from other people's mistakes, make sure you label stuff, make sure it's dry, put in an airtight container, um, I have kind of a nice big apothecary cabinet that all of my herbs stay in so that they're at, you know, constant temperature, dry, out of sunlight, kind of all those basics. Um, maybe that's not available to you, uh, but just making sure that they're not in direct sunlight is, is really helpful. Um, what else? What else can I tell you? Wow. Okay. So I promised to share the names of some books. We're going to do that. I'm going to share a couple of recipes. And then I'm going to go through um, a couple of these questions. Yeah, I'll go through some of these questions and try to address some of these for us. Okay, great. So um, books that I would recommend. So the Herbal Medicine Makers Handbook, if you want to be able to take that next step in um, preparing things more, you know, making some of these oil tinctures, uh, alcohol tinctures, salves. That's a really great kind of get you started sort of thing. Um, some of the other good kind of beginner sort of things. I think um, Susan Weed and Rosemary Gladstar do a nice job of having very approachable books where they don't um, overwhelm you with a ton of information, but kind of give you the 
<clears throat> the entry level basics about plants and kind of the entry level basics about doing some of the herbal preparations. Uh, the Family Herbal uh, by Rosemary Gladstar is one that, you know, it's just super approachable. It's got uh, some recipes for women, it's got some recipes for men, it's got some kids stuff in it. It covers, you know, some immune stuff, coughs and colds, uh, you know, just like uh, it, the stuff that comes up for the average family or the average person fairly regularly. So it's got a good amount of diversity in it. Um, if you're looking for things more specific to our area, um, things I would recommend is just getting yourself, I kind of mentioned this, some kind of a, you know, Minnesota wildflower uh, or, you know, upper Midwest wildflower identification guide. Not that it's going to be chocked full of medicinals. There will be some in there, but more from that aspect of um, starting to learn the terms for, for leaves and flowers and noticing things about stems and growth patterns, those kind of things that will really help you in your identification while you're out wild crafting. If you want stuff that's a little bit more specific to the medicinal plants, um, for our area, I think Lisa Rose does a really nice job. And um, I'm sure that their store is closed right now, but it won't be that way forever, right? Uh, North Hills Folk School actually has a pretty lovely selection, I think, of stuff that's specific to our area because they do bring up um, several regional herbalists to do a couple of class there. Gigi, I know, does some classes there. So they've brought in books specific to our area that kind of meet the level of the classes that they're teaching there. So Lisa Rose, she's got a couple different ones. I can't think of what the name of the other one is right now but she does a nice job with stuff that's specific to our area. And she also has some nice recipes in there and gives you some basics about, you know, figuring out how to do some real beginning salves and a couple of, of things like that. So it's an, a nice, well-balanced book, I think. Um, the Forager's Harvest, uh, Sam Thayer, I believe it is, is a nice one too. Um, this being out in the woods and, and doing the wild harvesting has kind of taken me into some wild foraging stuff that's been really fun. And so his, his book has got some really great ideas. Um, if I remember right, I think he also has, a, you know, another really lovely section on sustainable mindful harvesting that I really appreciated if I remember that book right. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned Susan Weed. And uh, she's got like the family herbal, she's got women's herbals, she's got stuff for kids. So also if there's like a very niche area that you're looking for, she's got, you know, a, a pretty big variety of books. If you're interested more in kind of um, some of the indigenous people's um, usage of plants traditionally, there's um, a couple specific to here. I picked one up in Grand Portage. I'm not thinking of the name of it right now. But there is um, the plants used by the Great Lakes Ojibwe. It's James Meeker, I believe. And then um, I've got one that's Indian Herbology of North America. So it's going to be a little wider span, but you'll find quite a few of our local um, medicinals in it. Um, and there's some really, some really great uh, stories and histories and traditions that are woven in those that I myself really enjoy. Uh, what else do we have on here that I'd recommend? So anything by Rosemary Gladstar. Matthew Wood is also a regional herbalist. Um, he does most of his stuff down kind of by the cities, but he's, he's fabulous. I remember reading one of his books. I don't remember exactly which one it was when I was pretty er early in my kind of herbal journey. And a lot of it went like right over my head. Um, at this point, I really appreciate the time and the detail. And he does have a little bit of a different approach to dosing than maybe some, or I would maybe even say most of the Western herbalists used to have. I think that's shifting within the community now. Um, so if you're like getting to the point where you're really curious about like, okay, now I made this stuff, like how much do I give them? You know, that kind of stuff. Um, you might want to explore some of Matthew Wood's concepts. He, and because he's based out of Minnesota, I think he spends some time really, really going into some of our medicinal plants in a really in-depth and really beautiful way that, that I absolutely can appreciate at this stage. Um, as I mentioned, the United Plant Savers that's talking about um, you know, at-risk plants. There's a really lovely book, if that's speaking to you, about specifically about growing at-risk medicinal herbs. Um, and then kind of on the more like 
um, spiritual energetic side. I think earlier I had talked about um, rose, not so much in its mm, constituents being good for the heart necessarily, or that, you know, inner, it being good for the energetic heart. And if you want to explore um, herbalism in a little bit more of that kind of spiritual energetic um, direction. There's a couple of good books. Um, one is called Plant Spirit Healing. The other one I think is called Sacred Plant Medicine. Um, Gail Edwards, I think, is is the author. Um, does one. It's it's something about opening our wild hearts to the wild plants or something along those lines. Um, you know, our library used to have a really nice selection. They had a book. I don't remember what it was called, but it was. I don't know, like a 400 page book that was specific to um, wild herbals from here. I know the library is not open right now, but um, again, sometime in the future, that might be an option. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's probably enough to get everybody started and rolling, at least for now. Um, and what else did I say that I was gonna try to cover? I said books and something else questions for sure. Okay, great. Well, let's take a peek at questions here and see. Okay. Ha oh, these are like away from this morning. Oh, okay. Q&A, here we go. Do you have any suggestions on companion planting for veggies? Um, Canyon planting for veggies. I mean, in in a way of answering like, do I companion plant with veggies? I do more so with my medicinal herbs. I companion plant with edible flowers. I like to weave um, nasturtiums, calendula, which can be both edible and medicinal, um, uh, like Johnny Jump Up kind of stuff. Things that I can pick and put in my salads or that just look really beautiful um, in things. I do more so. Um, certainly you can interweave with your vegetable garden, but like specific medicinal plants that pair well with specific vegetables is maybe not my strong suit on what would be best there. Although I did just read a, a lovely article about companion planting, and I know that that information is out there, probably something you could pretty easily um, Google. Okay, would you repeat those seed sources again or add to the chat? Um, I can do both. So let's first, I'll just give them to you verbally. And then at the end of class here, which will be very soon, I'll just type them in for you. Okay. Um, so uh, seed places. So strictly medicinal seeds is one. Uh, Richter's is the place that I mentioned that um, is a really good source for both seeds and plants. Fedco seeds, uh, seed savers. Mountain Rose, Peaceful Valley, and Crimson Sage are the ones that I had mentioned. Again, there's other ones out there. Those are just kind of my go-tos. Um, you know, other places that like I order vegetable seeds that I'll sometimes get stuff from Baker's Creek, I think does a really nice job. Um, is it Pine Tree? Um, also does a really nice job. So, you know, just really finding a company that kind of aligns with your values that, um, you know, they, you feel like they're organic and safe to use and true to variety, those kind of things. But I will add those to the chat um, as we're wrapping up here. And then thank you to the person who put in there that the reminder of the other thing that I was going to cover was the recipes. Yeah, I just had three little recipes that I threw at the end here that um, you know, it's great to have all this information, but it, the real fun, at least for me, comes in actually going and gathering the plants and making some stuff. So I wanted to share with you just three really simple recipes that you could put together with plants that we talked about today. Um, so the first one would be a um, Northern Minnesota bug spray, and that would be combining um, catnip, chickweed, plantain, and yarrow. Now, if you wanted, you could also add some essential oils that are known to um, be good. Lemon eucalyptus, uh, cedar, lavender. Um, but from the plant material, that's what I would do. 
uh, how, how you do that, you could do it a couple of different ways. You could do um, like an alcohol or a vinegar tincture. You could do it, um, a tincture it in oil and then have it be more like an oil that you rub onto the skin. Um, you could do it in maybe like a witch hazel with a little bit of vitamin E or something so it had a little more staying power. Uh, you could just make a straight tincture and put it on. So, but those would be kind of a plant combination that you could use there. Um, for just like a general kind of a wound healing salve, one that I make that's, you know, all local stuff is plantain and then pernella, which is the all heal or the self heal, St. John's wort and yarrow. And then again, you know, I would tincture those in kind of an oil tincture to then turn it into a salve or just leave it as an oil to be able to apply. Um, you wouldn't want to apply it to like a, like a deep puncture kind of thing, but any kind of like scrapes, burns, uh, bites, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> um, and then that again, you could add some essential oils to it. Like lavender is really good for kind of soothing itch, irritation, pain sort of stuff. So maybe lavender would be a good essential oil to mix to that if you want to take it another step. And then essentially, you know, once you infuse those things into an oil, I typically do a six to eight week infusion. Um, there's ways to do heat infusions. Different herbalists have different things around that. Then to make it into a salve, you just would need to add a certain amount of, of beeswax. And there's also no hard and fast rule on there. You can look at some books and get recommendations, but it's really about how firm or soft you want the salve to be. So you can kind of play around with those amounts. Um, everybody likes stuff that's a little bit different there. And then the last recipe, um, is based on a tea that I make for the angry trout. It's called a forager tea. And uh, some of the things that it has in it is some raspberry leaf, some nettle. Um, I typically dehydrate and use some dried apples, rose petals and rose hips. So I put both of them in. Red clover, a little bit of yarrow flower, and a little bit of cedar. And I actually use the the green part of the cedar, not cedar bark, and um, so the actual, actual needles. They're not needles. Words. <laughs> Words are hard right now. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, so there's there's three different recipes. One for kind of a, um, a bug spray, one for a, a skin healing salve, and then one for a tea that you can make for yourself. Um, so have fun playing around with those have fun getting out into the woods and finding and exploring plants. Please, please make sure that you know what you're harvesting. Sustain har har uh, <laughs> harvest sustainably. Uh, check for ticks when you're done. Be careful out there. One thing I didn't say is I typically keep some kind of a little first aid kit either in my harvesting basket or in my glove box if that's not something you already do. I can't tell you how many times I've been harvesting and accidentally cut my hand with my knife or tripped over a stick and, you know, stabbed part of a broken tree branch into my shin or some other fun thing. So making sure that you have uh, either the plants or the um, first aid stuff that you need with you to just take care of that while you're out can uh, make it much more enjoyable too. Um, I will take a minute here to type those seed companies into the chat. So if you still wanna write those down, stay here and I'll do that just momentarily. If there are any other closing questions, go ahead and type those in. And then we're two minutes past the end of class, so we'll go ahead and try to um, wrap things up. It was really fun getting to spend this time with you. Um, I hope you have a lovely season of gathering and getting to know the plants. And um, thank you so very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. So let's see, the seed sources we addressed, please list the ingredients of the three recipes. Okay, sure, yeah. I can type the ingredients of the recipes in the chat here too. And give me just a second and I will do that for everyone. This is Karen Blackburn popping in right at the end. Thank you all for joining us today. Bridget, thank you. That was an excellent, excellent job. It was really fun. And I want to remind you all that there will be a recording of this available on the Cook County Higher Ed website. So if you need to go back and review anything, you'll be able to do that. 
and we will edit out the begin very beginning and the whole hour that we were at lunch so you don't have to get through all of that and uh, thank you for coming and I hope you'll join us for future websites webinars not websites have a good afternoon Okay, so there's the name of the seed <clears throat> company. Sorry, I'm going to adjust my camera. I know that does weird things just so I can type a little more easily. And then I will type in ingredients here really quick for um, those recipes that we talked about. Okay, so I just put the bug spray in and on that I would probably do equal about equal parts of um, each. There is the salve, and I'm gonna put the tea in here real quick. We'll be all set. All right, great. So there is the final one for the tea. Again, thank you all so very much for coming. Perfect, great, all right. Much love to everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Bridget, I don't think um, we should log off for a few minutes until they have a chance to write those down. Okay, no problem or you can log off and I'll log off in a few minutes. Okay, all right, great. Thanks, I appreciate you being in the background and uh, reminding me to switch photos and stay on top of all that stuff. Have a good rest of your day. You too, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
Okay, I'm about to end the session. Does anybody still need me to stay logged in?